Brian Waller, Zoning Board of Appeals Chairman. Um, all of the members of the board that are um, going to be attending are attending in person, so I'm not going to do the um, confirmation that people can hear and be heard. Um, it is 7.02 p.m. This open meeting of the Grafton Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted both remotely and in person, consistent with Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, extending meeting, remote meeting protocols through March 31st, 2025. This meeting is convening by a Zoom video conference and in person, as posted on the meeting agenda, which can be found on the Town of Grafton website. Please see the meeting agenda for details on how to participate remotely. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. All participation within the meeting will be visible to others. Please be aware that other people may be may be able to see you and you should take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording of this meeting and replayed later. This meeting may feature public comment. Um, anyone attending virtually, if you'd like to request acknowledgement to speak, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Anyone that's only on the phone, um, we will coordinate uh, with our meeting administrator allowing you to speak. Um, anyone that does speak, we ask you to um, state your name and address for the record. And as this is a hybrid meeting, all votes taken will be done by a roll call vote. So um, the only item on the agenda this evening is the apartments at Snow Road. Um, I'm going to hand the meeting off to uh, Vice Chair, Mr. McCusker. Okay. Um, for the benefit of, of others, uh, I did miss the first meeting. However, I've reviewed it, um, the video, a couple times, and I have signed the Mullins form. Um, and also, just so people understand, uh, Chairman Waller and I have an understanding that when it comes to uh, 40Bs, that I generally will leave uh, meetings and, and any other efforts, et cetera. So um, I, I thank uh, Chairman Waller for filling in for me when I couldn't be here last meeting. But now I'm back. So with that, I turn it over to the applicant. I ask if you have anything new to present today, or can I go here, or should I? As long as you, as, as long, long as people as, can hear me, I, I don't as long as the guy in the booth can uh, hear you. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, thank you, John Grenier, J.M. Grenier Associates. Um, we, uh, the last at the last meeting, it was um, stated that we would deal with the civil site plan review, um, which is why you have Jeff Walsh here with Graves Engineering who performed the review. So uh, in terms of presentation materials, it's the same site plan, the same design that was submitted as part of the application and reviewed by Graves Engineering. So um, we did receive the review um, as you did from Graves Engineering. So. Um, we're anticipating the conversation being, you know, site specific regarding civil engineering, um, layout grading, et cetera, anything site specific for civil engineering. Um, and then obviously if there's other questions that come along as part of that discussion, we're, we're here to, to, to help discuss and, and, um, address those as well. Okay. So you really have nothing new at this point and you're looking to go right into the Graves review. Yes, if, okay. if that's the board's wishes. Jeff, you're on. All right. Good evening. For the record, my name is Jeff Walsh. I'm with Graves Engineering, uh, civil engineering peer reviewer for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, on October 29th, we issued our review letter, and the scope of our review was general civil engineering. It's not traffic. Um, I understand um, the at some point there may be a traffic peer reviewer, but that would not be our firm. Uh, so we looked at things such as compliance with local regulations, um, this being a 40B, the applicant be, can be looking at, um, looking to request uh, waivers from various local regulations. So uh, we look at zoning bylaw, uh, the wetlands, regulations, uh, the Grafton wetland regulations, not the state regulations. Uh, we looked at the Grafton stormwater regulations. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals has its rules and regulations. We looked at those as well. 
Um, we did a review of the hydrology, pre-development, post-development, the modeling methodology, input data, uh, output results. Um, I personally visited the site on September 17th um, and, and walked the entire site. Um, and I'll speak to that in a few minutes. Um, and basically, general engineering as far as land development goes. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I've the letter is four or five pages long. Um, I don't feel it's necessary that we get deep into the weeds of every little thing, but I'd like to highlight a few things if you'd like to follow along. All right, things that I'd like to um, make clear to the board what I saw, whether it's um, visiting the site or during our plan review, and just make the board aware of it. And, and I trust we'll be hearing from the applicant's team at some point. Um, if they disagree with any of my positions or if they're um, going to be considering plan revisions or anything to that effect. Anyways, if I could, on page one, I'll start with number, 22, uh, number two. Um, there's a loop driveway, if you will. Um, there's a boulevard-style entrance with cobblestone in between. So two, one lane in, one lane out, separated by the cobblestone. And then once you get in a short distance, there's a loop driveway. Much of the loop driveway in the back is 24 foot wide, but up near the front, it's only 22 foot wide. And, um, the zoning bylaw calls for 24 foot wide for these types of uh, uh, driveways. And, and whereas there's going to be more traffic on this part of the loop than in the back of the loop, I'd recommend that the, um, um, the driveway width be 24 feet. Um, moving on to number three, if there's any discussion or any questions along the way, I'd ask if, if you could interrupt me. We'll, we'll stay on point by point. Otherwise, I'll try to keep this moving right along. Uh, number three, earth removal calculations or, or estimated volume was submitted in the application materials. There's about 26,000 cubic yards of import. And my recommendation, um, because of the massing of the four taller buildings, uh, two of them are proposed on the plans to be three-story and two are proposed to be four. Um, the import of fill raising the elevations and then and then um, granted some of that fill is to be used to fill some low areas. Um, but nevertheless, um, to raise the grade and then raise the, um, the tall buildings, uh, there's, there's a massing issue there that can be part civil, part architectural. And, and my recommendation is um, consideration of trying to reduce the amount of fill, thereby hopefully lowering, lowering uh, finished elevations, at least in some parts of the project. Um, number four is a simple one, uh, identify the affordable units. I know in yeah. projects past we've... I, I think actually being a rental um, development, there's no identification. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I didn't know that. Actually, Stephen Venicas, actually, we do, as through the process, we do have to identify units um, before we get, pretty sure, I'm not sure if it's before we get a building, but we do have to do that, but it's uh, it's kind of semantics because once the project is all running, we move them all around anyway, so that we're not restricted. So you'll name the unit today, just to, I think, just to put a placeholder, and then as we're, as we're, throughout the years we're renting, we get to move around because the units are all the same. Right. I, I don't recall that being done on other rental pro, uh, projects, but okay, go ahead. And my thought on the reasoning behind the requirement in the, in the um, regulations is because um, in projects past, I've understood that the style, if you will, of different units, there needs to be about 25% affordable for the one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom townhouse style. Uh, not all the middle units on three unit can be the affordables and that that's was my reasoning for why it should be there in in into the applicant's point i i get it that things can change but yeah um, they're not set in stone but at least the board would have an understanding about how they're spreading out if you will the um if i if i could say again steve and casa um they do make us spread them all out throughout the whole building every floor every corner every place but then after the fact we're not required to maintain those it's just the initial lease up is all we're required to, just for your information. But I, and I think when we've talked about this in other projects, I, I think our intent was for it not to be specifically identified, right? With the intention that they will move location and yeah. be variable based on the 
Yeah. The state makes us, the state makes okay. us the state makes us do that. And it's beyond the civil engineering issues. Yep. So that's fine. <laughs> that's moving, that's right, moving right along. <laughs> it's just informational anyways. Sure. Um, item number six, uh, most of the site is in priority habitat and um, the portion thereof that is in priority habitat should be clearly marked on the plans. I understand uh, from the application materials, um, Mass Wildlife Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program that, that, that has jurisdiction over um, this habitat has been contacted and, and works ongoing between the applicant and, the, and, the, uh, and Mass Wildlife. Um, moving down to number 12, um, not that it's a big deal, but the cobblestone island in the entrance, I th certainly think that should be worthy of making sure there's a good gravel base under it to support fire trucks and any other emergency equipment coming in. Um, number 19 on page 3. Um, what I'm concerned about here is if you were standing on snow road looking at the site near the front um much to the left of the uh building that's there now the single family dwelling there's a low area that low area receives some runoff from the site and it also receives runoff or is down gradient of properties at number 18 and number 18 and a half snow road um, it's quite clear to me that there's probably water that May, the drains there, there's no question about that, and probably infiltrates pretty quickly. Um, the vegetation at the bottom of it is a little bit different than it's, what's around it. There's no tall trees. But the point at hand is this low area is proposed to be filled, and thereby there would be a retaining wall almost along the property line, and the runoff from the two abutting properties um, could no longer drain off of the abutting properties, and that's going to have to be considered as this goes forward um, there's different ways to address it so i don't want to go any further at this time but the property line and runoff coming over the property line from the abutting property should continue to be free draining and uh, moving on to number 21 there needs to be soil testing to support whatever infiltration system or systems are ultimately designed um, number 24, and by the way, we're now under the regulations for the, the graph of wetland regulations. Um, number 24, the regulations call for a 100-foot setback from the nearest dwelling to the infiltration facility um, is 90 feet proposed. Um, but again, requirements 100 feet, and I don't remember seeing a waiver request. Uh, moving on to um, page 4 under Mass DEP. Hydrology and Mass DEP, stormwater management. Um, number 29 and number 30 speak to, although the hydrology comments about how fast water will run into the ground at the infiltration facilities, um, soil testing needs to be done. So this ties back into the uh, previous comment I was talking about, as well as on the same page, page 4, moving down to number 35. Um, the site is likely sands and gravels, highly pervious, but nevertheless, um, soil testing would be prudent. And, and um, I had a brief discussion with Jeff, I think last week, and we um, made sure that we have the ability to get into the site, into those areas with a small machine to do the soil testing. And um, we would like to request to um, be able to schedule that with Jeff um, as soon as his schedules freeze up or is available to do that. So um, if we can either work directly with Mr. Walsh or go through the board, however you would like to do it. Um, I think generally we, we allow you just work directly. Okay. At the end of the day, you know, you're paying them. It's just get, get it done. Okay. Thank you. It's generally how the board is always operated. Yep. I think we're all good with that. It, and that goes along with how I work with the right. uh, planning board. Yep. And, and just for clarity for the audience, um, the town pays me, but they pay me with their money. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Big difference. Big no, difference. I, I, yes. Big difference. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you. For, thank you for clarifying okay. that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. You you are our peer review. That but. is correct. There is no contractual re right. relationship between us and the development team. Absolutely correct. Thank so you. the soil test will be witnessed by you or yes. someone in your team. Yes. Okay. Well, most likely me. Um, bottom of page four, general engineering comments. Uh, we recommend 
that a fire hydrant be located near the intersection of the boulevard entrance and the loop driveway. Um, I understand both the fire department and Grafton Water District would have the final say of hydrant locations, but I would have expected there'd be one um, in the entrance before the fire, fire truck makes a left or a right so they can attach to the hydrant and pull hoses left to right as they see fit without having to enter the project and pull backwards. Uh, moving on to page five. Um, comment number 38. Um, in the southwest area of the project near the property line, there's a dumpster pad proposed, and I'm recommending that it be moved away from the abutting property of number eight. It's very close to the dwelling of number eight. Um, number 39, um, pedestrian, this is probably going to be worked into the plans later on, but I thought I'd put a comment in here anyways. Um, um, provide, I recommend providing pedestrian sidewalks from the clubhouse to the playground and the playground to the residence buildings to the east. The, there's no sidewalk currently shown on the plans. There is a sidewalk coming to, the, to these, the clubhouse and the play, uh, playground and the pool from the west, the front of the site, not from the rear of the site where a lot of people might be walking from there, from their apartments. A very minor issue, and there's plenty of room to do it. Um, staying on the point of sidewalks, number 40, um, there's a sidewalk on Snow Road for a short distance from Worcester Street. Uh, coming away from Worcester Street, and then it terminates. Um, the plans are proposing to extend that sidewalk up to their entrance to the project. Um, in addition to that, I'm recommending, because of the, um, you know, the, the width, if you will, a geometry of Snow Road, the increased number of vehicles that would be generated from this project, um, that, you know, when traveling along the same route of people that already use Snow Road for pedestrian access, you know, there'd be more mix of pedestrians and vehicles. And from the fact that um, the number of dwellings in the project would likely um, generate some pedestrian traffic, those that like to walk the area, I'm recommending the sidewalk be extended to the north as well. And um, I looked at the two streets um, to the north. Suzanne Terrace is the father of the two streets before before you get to um, a, a, a horizontal curve and, and, and what was a real looks like the realignment of Snow Road when Mass Pike was built, um, I'm, you know, there'll be discussion, I'm sure, but but you know, consideration should be going as far as, in my opinion, at least as far as Suzanne Terrace. <clears throat> hey Jeff, hmm? is the sidewalk on the other side of Snow Road? There's no sidewalk on Snow Road except for short distance off of Worcester Street. Okay, and what side, because it looks like they're proposing a sidewalk on the opposite side of Snow Road than the project site. They are to the <clears> extent <throat> the existing sidewalk. And my look at both the plans with respect to the property lines and what I could gather from where is Snow Road compared to the Snow Road right of way, I'm not sure which, which side of Snow Road would be more favorable. It would be best, in my opinion, to try to keep the sidewalk only on one side of Snow Road, west side of the east side, north, south, or whatever. Um, it looks to me like it may be a little more shoulder width available on the side where the sidewalk already is on Snow Road. So it could be a continuation the, the entire way. But that's something that would have to be vetted out through the design process to get a good handle on the, the width of the shoulders available on either side of Snow Road. But if you put the sidewalk on, on that side of it, then you need a crosswalk, and the crosswalk they're proposing is just, it's not at an intersection. Yeah. And so it, it, yeah. it raises a safety issue. Sure. Oh, there's going to be pedestrian demand from both sides of the street. There's a housing authority project um, near the intersection of, of Worcester Street and Snow Road that might generate some pedestrian traffic. There's the neighborhood at large that would generate pedestrian traffic. There's more subdivision streets on the same side of Snow Road as there is um, the project that would 
tilt the scale to that side of the street? I, I don't have the answer which is better. Mm -hmm. All the pluses and minuses would have to be weighed out if a sidewalk's going to be done. The one thing that one should strive to, strive to avoid is having crosswalks just to move the pedestrian traffic back and forth because mm -hmm. pick this side for a while and then pick the other side for a while for a sidewalk. And so right now we don't have any design plans yeah, no, no. Side, for no. the sidewalk. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. They have put forward that they intended to take the sidewalk from their project in the other direction. Toward so we would need to see a plan showing where the right of way is, where the street is, just to, to test out the, vibe, the feasibility of this. Because we don't know if it's feasible unless we see how much room they have within the right of way. Right? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a big advocate for safe pedestrian access and, and you know projects projects that have dwellings they, they they just naturally generate some some interest in pedestrian traffic for um, exercise and so forth and if I can jump in for a second we were out uh, I believe it was last week yeah about a, a week ago we were looking at the same the same things you're discussing we were looking at in the field and we were walking up and down snow road and it, it is a little challenging because of the width of the right of way and where there is um, sidewalk that goes from the intersection with 122 um, to the north but then there is a crosswalk that cuts over to Maxwell Drive um, and there is sidewalk that goes up along in front of Maxwell Drive but it's it's awkward to say to say the least so at the end of the day um i think we're on the same page where we want to make sure that there's good pedestrian access um, from the project in both directions and we can work with uh, whether it's through graves engineering or part of the traffic review we're, we're willing to work and and do what's what's appropriate we we, we did agree the sidewalk especially the sidewalk on that west side uh, of Snow Road is steep also, and we think that it, we can work with either, I don't know who owns that land on the corner, the Housing Authority or the town? Yeah, That's part of, still part of the Housing Authority. Yeah, if, if we could work with them and making a better uh, configuration and a better grade, we'd be happy to make that improvement. Okay, um, still on page five, number 46. Um, these are ju just about done with my my stuff. Um, back to that depression um, left of the uh, building on the on the site. Um, it's a possibility it could be considered isolated land subject to flooding under the Mass Wetlands Protection Act regulations um, because of its size. Um, it certainly has enough volume that it potentially could hold um, the requisite depth and volume of, of water. Whether or not any water actually gets to it is to be had, but that potentially is an isolated land subject to flooding. Isolated land subject to flooding doesn't necessarily have and usually often does not have wetland vegetation. It's a depression that holds at least a quarter acre foot for an average depth of at least six inches and there's different ways to evaluate it. One is, is known evidence, seeing water standing in there for a period of time. Uh, absent that, it's, it's evaluating where the surface water runoff, enough runoff is generated uh, to meet that volume and if the depression's big enough to, to uh, hold that volume. This a is- A vernal pool? No, no, a vernal that's pool- That's different? That's different. Oh. Yep, a vernal pool could be one of these but a vernal pool definitely has standing water, but not entirely year round. So fish can't survive. So the, the other critters, the amphibians and reptiles that are in it can survive. That's what a vernal pool is. And there's ways to evaluate that. The wetland scientists do based upon, they go out and actually try to figure out what's living in there. And does it meet the criteria for what type of, um, what type of um, species of animals are there? This, this isolated land subject flooding has only to do with holding water. So in the winter, if it's frozen and we get rain, and it, it's frozen so the water can't go down through, and it holds water, <clears throat> what's that called? 
Well, no, that a, a nothing. Or, or, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's a good question. Well, I, if I, you get rain on ice, you get enough. I mean, melt on frozen ground. Unfolding. Yep. Yeah, that, that you very valid point. One of the ways to under the Wetlands Protection Act regulations to evaluate it is known evidence, clear evidence, um, whether it's um, clear evidence of the, the, the depth of the impoundment and it can be measured and surveyed and figure out the volume, evidence that people bring forward that it does or does not hold water, visual evidence can be, and then absent all that, the regulations do have a way that you do hydrology modeling to see how much runoff is generated that runs to this and whether it meets the criteria for the one year storm event. And if it meets the criteria for the one year storm event, you rerun the calculations for a hundred year to figure out how high the water impounds and that that is the, the land that's subject to flooding. Yep. But it, it's a whole different thing than a vernal pool. Okay. Yep. Physically they can look the same and they could be the same. Is one better or worse than the other for trying to put a building on it uh, I'm not sure Peter oh. Wait, Frank, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, one has to do with living things and one has to do with hydraulics so I, I, the question I was gonna ask okay, so you get to the point where you identify this thing right yep. you did this with your fingers yep Wh what does that mean to me the builder <laughs> you the builder that's that's a depression that holds water that is regulated and you cannot fill that in unless you're going to replicate that flood okay. storage somewhere else. Okay. Replace that flood storage somewhere else. Yep. Hmm. It has but to, you have to, have to be, it has to be from the tributary area to I that. So it has to be, I want to say hydraulically connected, but not necessarily. But yeah, it probably does. It, it has to be yeah. hydraulically connected okay, to the tributary it. area. All right, thank yep. you. And Sorry, just to back up a little bit. Where was... Where was this on the northwest corner of the site? Um, is this what you mentioned at the yes, very it beginning? Is. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Where the existing house is, to the if you're facing the site to the left, down to the woods, it drops off. Yep. But where it drains from, I think eight, and eighteen and eighteen eight, and a half. Yeah, and a little bit on the site. Quite honestly, I'm not sure if it's going to qualify or not because it's in sand and gravels. If it was in till area, there's a much better chance that it would qualify. Um, but but that speaks to the depression itself, and the earlier comment had to do with whether the depression stays or the depression goes. The other properties can, need to continue to be free draining. Uh, moving on to page six, um, uh, comment number fifty one. Now we're in the waiver request section. I've got. Um, the site is, is within the Water Supply Protection Overlay District, and um, they're going to render more than, um, uh, I, f I forget what the, what the 51%. I think it's 51% 50, is proposed. I think the trigger was 15% or 2,500 square feet, whichever is greater. Anyways, they, they trigger the point where there needs to be an evaluation of recharge. And um, what I'm recommending, one, um, they don't centralize the recharge in only one area. Um, try to spread it out where they can. And um, um, this is this was done on the Pleasant Preserve a Pleasant Commons project where there, there was um, decentralization. That way, if any one system fails, especially an open basin that can be more prone to sediment than, than roof runoff systems, um, still get the recharge. Um, also. Um, as far as getting deeper into the review of this is the hydrology, if the hydrology gets revised based upon plan revisions, I'd like to reserve further comment now, but I will say um, to the design engineer, what I look at is pre-development versus post-development volume. Surface water runoff volume, which is what we see in the hydrology calculations, the more volume you have running off, the less you have infiltrating into the ground. My point is I, I can glean, easily glean runoff volume pre-development versus both post-development. I can back out of that what was the change in infiltration to the underlying soils, either from the ground cover types or from artificial recharge, like from the subsurface chamber systems. Right now, they're, they're showing a decrease in recharge volume. But um, 
as as the site development plans evolve and the hydrology the supports that evolves i'm going to hold comments as, and, and look at those in things as we get deeper into it and then lastly um well, i missed one i went back up to number 50. um I had a feeling you'd go over that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Parking calculations. Um, again, working with this board on other projects, I know availability of parking has is, is been subject of much discussion. Um, the regulations require 2.25 parking spaces per dwelling unit for multifamily. I look at both the townhouse style and the larger apartment buildings as multifamily in general. Um, so the bylaw calls for the 2.25 spaces per dwelling unit. Um, the applicant is um, proposing a number of parking spaces that equates to overall for the project 1.72 parking spaces per dwelling unit. But it's a little skewed to the townhouses because the townhouses have two parking spaces per dwelling unit. One parking space inside the garage, one in the driveway. Um, whereas that means that the parking rate will be a little bit lower than 1.72 for the large, larger buildings. What I did in evaluating this is I also looked at the parking available in the larger lots, the buildings, number of dwelling units in the larger buildings, and that rate was 1.66 parking spaces per dwelling unit. And when I went to the Institute of Traffic Engineers parking generation manual or table or whatever they call it it's a set of set of numbers that they're developing similar to the trip generation but it's not nearly as complete a set of data as the trip generation um what they have is they have for different land use types low rise mid rise high rise um they have they'll present the data how many how many um samples they have or, or studies that are involved I, when there's a low number of studies i worry about how valid the data are um, but with the higher number of studies and these had some reasonably high numbers of studies um, the 85th percentile that percentile of which 85 percent of the time the parking demand is less than or equal to the 85th percentile is 1.66 parking spaces per dwelling unit and that's what's being proposed for the larger buildings looking at the large surface lots 1.66 i've seen a few in other engineers try to use average to me that means half the time you don't have enough parking half the time you do so 85th percentile is is a valid thing to look at for travel speeds on roads traffic engineers use the 85th percentile speed as well um for the record the town the the tables also have a 33rd percentile so 33% of the time, the parking demand is, is that or less. So 85th percentile is the way to go. As of right now, they have that. My recommendation as the minimum, whatever whatever settles out on this project, if it goes forward, they have at least that, that rate for the uh, larger buildings. And then lastly, um, down to number 53, this has got to do with the... Uh, a waiver request to the Grafton Wetlands Protection Bylaw um, that has a 25 foot no disturb zone around any resource areas, not only those, any of those that are triggered under the local regulations, not in the Mass DEP, and the local regulations do have some additional resource areas that the Mass DEP regulations don't have. For example, isolated wetlands. Um, I'm recommending that. Um, they're they're going to disturb within the 25-foot no-disturb zone if the board is willing to grant the waiver to allow the disturbance. I'm recommending that rather than replicate, uh, replant it in grass, get replanted in um, species that would normally be there around around this wetland area, more of a back to the brushy type of um, understory that's there now. Mr. Chairman, those are the things I wanted to discuss and bring to your the board's attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. <coughs> questions from the board. No 
Okay. I've got a few. Um, so Jeff, the I, I'm sure you went through the stormwater management. Yes. And I assume that they're meeting the whatever the state minimum requirements are. They they are. There hasn't been testing to prove out a few things yet. Soil testing to prove out. Okay. But things things are are in line with that exception. Okay. As you know, um, this is in the wellhead protection zone two. Mm-hmm. Are there things above and beyond the state minimum that they could do to further protect the groundwater? There's always more that can be done. Um, okay. There's always more. And, and what, the, what the state pushes for for um, trying to protect critical areas, and, and Zone 2 of a wellhead is, is one of the critical areas, bathing beaches, shellfish areas, uh, shellfishing areas, uh, those are other examples, cold water fisheries, uh, but nevertheless, there are things that DEP pushes, and those tend to be filtration types of um, impoundments. Um, they also tend to be um, treatment type of impoundments with this, for example, natural vegetation to take up more pollutants. Um, those are pushed. Um, they did meet the minimum requirements with respect to critical areas. But they, they, you, they, uh, on the plans that you reviewed, there's none of those above and beyond things to... No. Okay. And, and I mean, we, 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 I believe we had the developer, for example, um, on Pleasant Street do some of these sorts of things, you know, because of the location relative to uh, the pond and things like that. Yeah. 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 What they did there is at the board's urging, um, they, in addition to the two open basins they had, they went with subsurface infiltration at other places around the site to, yeah. um, Distribute the that that distributes the stormwater, um, and it and it plays out more so to the filtration, uh, and and it also doesn't rely on just one or two open impoundments. And and lastly, it you know what um, the filtration is in the soil. They ended up not going with any type of uh, planted type of wetland impoundments or anything like that. Okay, but all right. So you know to to the applicant. I mean, this is not new. This was brought up, you know, going way back to the, the select board uh, discussions. Um, and, you know, I'm a little disappointed that you've done, haven't done anything to address those concerns. And this member of the board is going to expect that, okay. right? We, you know, you, this is this is our town's water we're talking about. And, um, you know, to, to come before us and, and basically just meet the state minimum, I, that's not acceptable, right? So, you know, that we, there needs to be more done. In that regards, um, all right. Another and, issue I have. We're not opposed. We're not opposed to that. Yeah. I, thank you, um, Katrina. Can you bring up the parking plan? I probably should have given you a little bit of that. So. Actually, before we get to the parking plan, um, the townhomes, two bedroom or three? Both. So we're looking for the feedback from the board, but they'll encourage more three bedrooms. So we, we right now we, we're proposing. Uh, Three bedrooms in the middle and two bedrooms on the end, right, John? I believe so. So the, okay, so, so the unit mix uh, in the application has an all three bedroom. The drawings in the architectural plans show two, no threes. Yeah. Well, which is? Well, we're looking. We we were going back and forth on that question there, and we had heard to some people in town that you wanted to encourage to do more three bedroom units. So we, we have the ability to do three bedroom or two bedrooms. So that that's we have that flexibility and we're looking for some direction and feedback from the board. So okay. we're not telling you we're gonna do all three bedrooms and you say, no, we don't want all three bedrooms or we do all two bedrooms and you tell us you want three bedrooms. So we are flexible on that. Right now we're tentatively planning on putting three bedrooms in the middle, two Two of them, so it would be 50% three bedroom, 50% two bedroom. Okay. 50% three. Two. So that we're All looking right. for feedback. And it, is that included in the the mix of units? I think there's a table that shows. So we some are better. on on the overall the, on the overall development table, which is sheet C2. Um, we do have it listed that. All the townhouses, there's 44 townhouses, those are all three bedrooms. 
Um, and then and everywhere else I mean you know and then there's always a, there's a mix of I think there's two is it two three bedrooms per floor I don't know. it was 10% it was uh, three bedrooms in the multi-story building also and then a mix of uh, 35 and 35%. okay so yeah obviously we need to straighten that out yeah um, and, and to, again we're we're flex if it's the wish of the board to have a, a with the townhouses a mix of twos and threes or have more threes have less threes the the style of the units won't change it it would be more of the the interior layout on on the, the floor plans I, I don't i don't necessarily have an opinion on that at, at this time okay um the, the whether how many twos and threes I, I don't have an opinion on that the issue is this i went to look at the architecturals of those townhomes to see how much storage space is, is provided for the tenants, and, and it's pretty much none. And what that means is the garages become the storage spaces. And the garages, according to the architecturals that you provided, are tiny. They're 12 by 20. That's barely enough for a car. So what's going to happen is the tenants are going to be parking in the driveways. They're not going to be parking in the garage. We see this all the time, all over with, with townhomes. So then the question becomes, and Katrina, if you could just kind of go down, so we're looking at the top of uh, the parking plan and maybe center it a bit. Go down further, stop right there. So now the question is, somebody has stuff in their garage, they have one car, and, and these are three bedroom units, um, so probably a family, uh, you know, husband and wife or you know, two, two adults, what have you. One's in the driveway, where is the other car parked? Because there is absolutely no parking except going around the other side of those garages and essentially that, in theory, that parking is more for the, um, you know, for the, uh, for the, the multi-story apartments. And it's not just the ones along the northern border, it's all of the townhomes are exactly the same problem. So I, I, I you know, I have two comments. One, uh, you know, I, I think those townhomes really need to have two parking spots per unit in the driveway, all right? And I think just about every uh, townhome style development that this board's approved, that's the way it's been. Um, either, in a, either means a double garage or just the way it's laid out, you get two, two parking spots in front of the garage. Um, but then it's also, even let's go beyond the people living there, you know, they're having the proverbial birthday party or somebody staying over. I mean, it doesn't look that there's really a whole lot of guest parking for those units. And while we're talking about those units, um, Mr. Walsh, if I could maybe put you on the spot a little bit. Um, I'm good at that. It's all right. <laughs> I, I believe, if, if I'm reading the, 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 the uh, plans correctly, I believe the height, the, the ground level height of those um townhomes is about 350. I and i think you are right and if you look at the easterly end the homes on suzanne terrace are down around 332. Um, the ground level uh if we go along the northern property line uh, for units seven through all the way up through about 23 the front the ground level is about 351 feet elevation 351 feet yeah looking at the abutting properties uh number 18 and num number 18 is around 352 ground elevation at the dwelling yeah but go all the way to the all the way down suzanne i think you're going to find that they're quite a bit less the, you're right once you yeah. get to uh house number 25 it's down around 340 feet so, I think it's. I thought I thought I was leaning like three thirty two, but okay. So uh, those it, houses. It, it are, is as you go yeah. farther to the east. Yeah, yes. exactly. So yes. all the way down, those houses are about twenty feet below um, the townhomes, and you know I, I just I, I think that's just terrible for the folks on Suzanne Terrace, um, and then the other thing is those buildings are fourteen point three feet off the property line. I mean, they're, they're, they're within a setback. 
you know, at Prentice Place, we required a 15 foot no disturb. 15 foot no disturb um, along the property line, along um, where, where there was residences. So in my mind, you know, I, I, I and, and actually now that Prentice Place is built, I don't know how many of you have gone up there. I, it's, it's not enough. Yeah. Right? Japanese not weed or not. <laughs> it's not enough. Um, so, you know, I, I, have, I have a real concern about that whole line of townhomes. And quite frankly, I, in my opinion, they need to go. Um, that we need a good heavy buffer along Suzanne Terrace um, <laughs> before we start having, you know, people building townhomes and things like that uh, along along those along that property line. But uh, you know, 15 feet, 14.3 feet off the property line, that's that's way too close, in my opinion. But I, I think it goes back to the, I think the broader issue of just density of this development. Well, yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Can I ask a question, Bill? Yeah. Um, just on the parking count, I, are there two spaces per unit for the townhouses or more? We have a garage, a garage space. Yep. And then a, a parking space in front of the garage. What about the garage buildings? Right. You, you have the garage then and the, the townhouse. Then you have the garage buildings. Yes. Then those are. I mean, we've done that on on other projects where you have. De the detached garages where that's available for um, for the use by tenants as well. So if someone needs, someone has, well, they need extra storage space, there may be a garage space available. If they have an extra vehicle, they have a motorcycle, they have something, it, it's it's an extra amenity that they can have. So okay, they so can have additional. They're not, they're not um, designated for any sp specific site. Could be anyone with an all site. Okay, could, so th those are just extras. So yes. each unit has one garage space and one driveway space in front of it. Correct. And then they have the option of maybe renting. Correct. One of these additional. Correct. Okay. And while we're on the point of the the eight car, six car garage garages that can be rented. My discussion earlier of the 1.66 parking spaces per dwelling unit that included the garage, those garage spaces. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the open surface parking spaces. The 1.66 for the apartment buildings includes the the garage spaces, not in the not in the townhouses. It includes the garages, the free parking spaces, the free and the surface parking. spaces. Yes, yeah. okay. yes. So are those garage? So are the extra garage spaces are going to be available to rent? For the multifamily building tenants, who are pretty much a, anyone. We, we don't, but that's yeah. that's who will end up using them. So yes. that's going to be a premium on top of the rent. It sounds. It like. will be, and right. and Jeff assumed that they would when he figured his one point six six. He assumed that the freestanding garages would all be dedicated to the uh, multi-story apartments. We do the same thing. Yes. Yeah. For the but, sake. But the reality is actually what you just said is they could be rented to townhome people. It's so, possible, but yeah. not li likely. Yeah. yeah. For the sake of the calculation, I had to draw the line somewhere. Understood. I figured as the site as a whole, some of those garage spaces could be rented out to the townhouse people, but nevertheless. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, has the fire department run their model uh, for the tower through this drawing? Not to my knowledge. Okay. They normally would ask the design engineer to do it. They'll provide the um, okay. attorney right. template. I, the, I, I don't know about you, Jeff. I'll just ask you right off the top of your head. Is, doesn't it look like there's a few pretty tight spots? There, uh, as long as there's nobody parked well <laughs> <laughs> on the side, <laughs> that's well, a big effort. The, um, <laughs> the, the uh, right here, uh, the 90 degree turn in front of units at the bottom left, in front of units 39 yeah. and 40, is a little concerning to me. I, at 24 foot wide, the vehicle is going to get through. It's not going to stay in its own travel lane. And um, fire departments have been having a discussion about that. And um, I'm not going to speak for the fire department. Yeah. I don't know where they're at. But okay. um, yeah, you could, you could get through that one comfortably, but you wouldn't be in as long as there's nobody parked along the side. Yeah. Um, quite frankly, it looked like that and the one in front of five and six might be the most concerning for the um what they call the tower, tower so one so I, what, what i was looking at was more down at the bottom the bottom right of the picture that we're looking at on the screen here mm -hmm. you know if, if, if there's a fire or an issue in that building 
I believe they're going to want to have the tower, you know, on essentially the right side of that island of parking. Agreed. And that that's that one looks like a, a really tight pinch point to, to get there. Whereas, they you know be, the way they've got that, they, they've kind of cut the corner on the left side, so you could probably get in there easy enough. But it's that other one. But okay, so obviously the the fire department needs to do their thing to make sure that this all works. But it just looks very concerning to me. Um, all right, um, Bill. On that topic, I, these these parking spaces are very short. I mean, they're 18 feet long, oh. right? Some of these driveways are short, yep. and we, we've had this issue before where people don't park right up against their garage door. They right. park a few feet so they can walk between the car and the garage door. We, we so, always made it at least 22 feet from yep, the garage absolutely. door. Absolutely. But, right. but the parking spaces are only 18 feet, it looks like. And again, that's that's going to, if those cars are sticking out beyond 18 feet, that's going to take up space in that drive aisle, which is yep. the fire access road. Yep. All right. Um, so, in other words, my pickup that's 20 feet long is going to be sticking two feet out in the road, which yep. turns a 22-foot road into a 20, um, or a 24 the, into a 22. Right. No, Just absolutely. For, for clarification, on the on the townhouses, um, where there is no sidewalk, which is on the the outer side of the loop, so to speak, we have 24 feet from the the face of the garage to the edge of the traveled way. And where the sidewalk is, which is on the inner loop where the townhouses are, we maintain 24 feet from the face of the garage to the back side of the sidewalk. So if you have 24 feet clear, so if somebody's walking on the sidewalk, they're not, you know, they have 24 feet to the between the edge of the sidewalk to the unit so all right so, so to be around. clear backside means the house side <coughs> correct not the road side. correct okay. correct so we maintain 24 feet um either to the to the house side of the curb or um where there's no sidewalk to um, <coughs> to the edge of the traveled way and where there just so you know our rationale was where we had 22 feet, that was primarily um, in the section of the driveway that's in front of the townhouses. Um, and th there's typically not a lot of, I'd say, conflict if you're backing out of your driveway, where where the parking, the, the parking, striped parking lot is where the um, multi-story buildings are. We made that 24 feet so that if you have a car parked on the other side of the driving aisle, you have that. I, I run into it. You know, you're at Dunkin' Donuts in the morning. You pull in, and you know you go to pull out, and you're always looking over your shoulder, hoping you don't bang into the guy on the other side of the driving aisle. So where there's the the bigger parking fields, uh, we maintain 24 feet. But at the townhouses, and it's a balance. You're trying. You don't want a place to be a sea of pavement. With you want to leave. A green space you want to try to separate things out so we try to make that it, make sure it's functional but I don't want to turn it into a sea of pavement either so we're trying to do a balancing act but with that said we understand Jeff's point where um, you know if there's going to be a lot of traffic circulating to have 24 feet is it's nice um, it's better but Again, it's a balancing act, trying to keep the amount of pavement down and trying to leave as, as much green space as we can. Okay. Have you given us a turning template or an auto turn analysis on this yet? No, we need to do that. And I can reach out to the fire department to get the templates for, um, you know, whichever truck, whichever vehicle they want, so that we can model that vehicle and, and do an a auto turn um, analysis of that. All right. Um, any other questions? Parking comments, yep. Yes, with respect to the townhouse parking, I learned this many, many years ago. A certain member likes 22 feet, <laughs> and, and it works, and it works. And yeah. I, I'm using it now on other reviews only because there are some long vehicles, and Absolutely. unless they squeeze up too tight to the garage, they're protruding in the back if it's a longer vehicle. Yep. Absolutely. And there is 22 feet to the back of the sidewalk or to the curb if there's no sidewalk. Okay. Actually, 24, yeah. Okay. Any other parking issues? 
All right, so the next issue I have, um, part of the LIP agreement is um, it talks about a playground and access, public access to the playground. So, Katrina, <coughs> you can just push that down a bit. <coughs> Stop. I assume the playground we're talking about is that dotted line in the center adjacent to the pool. Is that the playground that's supposed to be available for public access? Yeah, and it's approximate. Um, I mean, we have a, a large... You know, we have a patio, we have a pool area, we have a large green space back there, so there so, hasn't been a specific yeah. right. playground. I, you know, it, it, let's be honest. Nobody from the public is going to go use that playground. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed that our select board went along with something like that. Um, but I, I think it would, I, I think... It would be really good for that whole neighborhood, unless there's already something around there that I'm not that I'm not aware of. But for that whole Suzanne Terrace and then up, you know, uh, that whole neighborhood, I think it might be nice if there actually was a legitimate playground available uh, that um, you know somebody could uh, could drive to, have some parking spots there, and and, and go and use it. And, and maybe it's even something you turn over to our parks department if, if, if they'd want it. But you know, I can see something a long snow road, a legitimate playground that this development provides not only for its tenants, but for the community. I think that would be one of those things that's a benefit to the community. Um, it's part of the LIP agreement. I don't know, I can only imagine what the select board was thinking. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's something I'd like you to look at. If, if we're gonna have a playground that's supposed to be accessible to the public, I don't think it should be all the way into the middle of the project behind the clubhouse sort of thing. You know, I've, that's just not realistic. Um, all right. Honestly, that, that's actually the most desirable spot of a whole development is right in that green space right there. Desirable spot for what? Of our whole development, that's the most desirable. What we consider, it's, it's a further away from the road, further away from the buildings. It's all green area. It's like a kind of a common area. So we, we consider that the most desirable area. That's why we put clubhouse and our pool there. So that's just from our point of view. Yeah. But, you know, again, um, you know, at this point, these projects are supposed to be more, you know, supposed to be, you know, what, what's in it for the community as well, especially because it's supposed to be a lip. Um, so um, the select man identified, that's one of the things that's listed in the development agreement. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that this board has a responsibility to kind of make that realistic. Um, uh, any, all right. So just uh, one of one other thing I just want to mention. Um, last week, somebody specifically asked about retaining ownership. Um, you know, uh, somebody I think had said something along the lines of, well, they could sell it and you get some sort of foreign investors in. Um, and it was stated at the time that the applicant has no intention of selling it and they won't sell it, et cetera. But I think it's important what needs to finish that thought is this board can't stop the developer from, for, can't stop this developer from selling it. Um, and in fact, we've had three 40Bs um, be sold from the time we granted the permit to when a shovel went in the ground. So it happens. So I just want to finish that thought um, that came out last week. It could it could be sold. And I, I take them at their word for it. They have no intentions of selling it. They have a lot of developments, et cetera. But it can happen, and we can't do anything to stop it. Um, all right. So then my question to the applicant is, um, at the last meeting, you really weren't aware of all the comments, et cetera, on the web, um, but you said you'd go through them. Have you gone through them? And there was various things that were suggested in there. And, you know, I, I guess I was expecting to see you come forward with things that you've, that you, in, you, you took information from input and added it to the plan. I mean, and, and I, that's what I was expecting to see happen, and, and it has. I mean, it, should we be expecting that or? Yeah, now that we have um, some some site-specific comments from Graves Engineering, we're going to be, you know, obviously looking at those comments, taking into account 
other comments um, you know you're talking about you know some of the elevations and whatnot so as opposed to piecemealing it we'd like to look at everything holistically okay. that, that's, that's fair and, that's fair um, start making changes as okay. opposed to, you know but you know, but it, it, it's not just that right so I mean like the chief of police uh, requested um, amongst other things like a traffic light but things that you definitely can do and that's providing the the lighted radar signs right so it'd be nice to hear you acknowledge that and say yes we will provide that you know that sort of thing now you know maybe we'll get into that a little more when we get mm -hmm. to traffic review but you know my expectation is that you know you've gone through all of these things and and addressed various things especially you know s you know straightforward suggestions like that right and it, it, in terms of um i'm assuming will be getting into a, a traffic peer re, a traffic peer review and again things along snow road in terms of uh, improvements at the intersection well, i mean that was that was within the lip yep we're obviously anticipating doing that the sidewalk alignment um the, you know any flashing you know yep. lighting that's that's something we'd like to look at all of the comments the you know where the sidewalks are going the length of the sidewalks um, look at that holistically and then put a plan together um, just so again so we're not piecemealing you know we're sticking our finger in the dike as we go along we like to look at all of the comments um, all of the peer review comments all the comments from town departments and then put a, a comprehensive plan together that addresses everything Excellent. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any other at this point issues with respect to um, you know kind of the site plan review and what Graves? Anyone have any comments or thoughts or questions? I do, but uh, I just want to point out that the one thing that I hadn't commented about is centralized mailboxes and if there's going to be like in a residential dwelling, I mean residential neighborhood versus everything's already allocated in the clubhouse. I don't know what the what what they're planning for mailboxes. I'm just worried about people coming home, pulling up to a mailbox, parking, and, and clogging up traffic. And I'm not sure how that's being addressed. It might have been in the application materials. Quite frankly, I've got a note on the plans here, but I don't have a comment, and I don't remember having looked at that in detail. Okay. Thank you. I I, I would suggest that that should probably get added to your. You know, the, the next version of your letter, which I'm sure will. Certainly, <laughs> unless it's already on the plans. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, I envision I, my letter won't be coming out for a while because yep. it will be responding to what, what right. we're going to see. And in so. other projects, um, the mailboxes have been in the clubhouse, um, but that's not to say that we can't do a hybrid. And, um, and in one project, that the post office specifically told us to put them in the buildings. So yeah, I would think they have some say in it as well. We've done both. So we've done both, yeah. actually. Okay. It seems like the here the clubhouse is pretty far from right. the park. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I think that's that so I, I think the important thing is, you know, you need to work out where it's gonna be mm -hmm. and then we need to make sure that there's parking, you know, sufficient parking around it. Right. Mr. Waller. Uh, so just in, in terms of coming back with a um, revised plan it have you put thought into just reducing the density kind of broad strokes um, or is your intent still to kind of stick with generally what's been proposed we, we, we don't intend to come in here with a take a live it plan we, we expect to make changes and the last time we just the, the, lip, the project we just got approved in Melbourne. We we made a number of changes and we worked well with the board. So we'd hope to have the same relationship here. Um, um, what I think the mistake we did with the last time we did is we made we made so many changes and we went and did so many design changes and we really consumed a lot of resources and we try not to do that here. Like John said, to come in here with we don't want to come in here with ten different plans with you. We'd like to hear all the comments, put it all together. And then, and then, kind of one or two plans maybe uh, that we come in with here. So well, I mean, I hear you, and, and there's, uh, I think there's, you know, many aspects of this that are 
you know, going to continually be revised. But I'm, I'm thinking there's, you know, just conceptually, the amount of units on this parcel, um, you know, it, and the parking is a reflection of that. It, you know, it, it's just not large enough to support the number of units that you're proposing. Um, and I think, you know, it almost needs a, some sort of a conceptual overhaul in my mind. We density wise, um, affordable housing uh, is a more dense product as, as we've seen and the density here considered density further east. Um, the site, we originally had the site slated for 300 units and then we talked to the selectman about it and we reduced that number down with the agreement on the lip to the 268. 268. Um, again, we're not drawing a line in the sand that we, that we, we would never come in here with a plan that doesn't work for us because we can't build something that doesn't work. We, we know it has to meet all safety requirements as far as, and, and, and we may make adjustments when we do the turning radiuses. Um, they, they may not work or they may work. We think they work um, to make sure all the parking spaces work. We know that, we know we don't come out with a perfect plan, but we would like to come in with a good plan. And, uh, and we know we're gonna have to make some changes along the way. So um, the, the parking, again, um, we think that ratio that we think we know that ratio works for us um, and like John said to have too many parking spaces too much asphalt is undesirable if we make those roadways wider too wide um, yeah they're nice you could drive faster down them uh, but we don't necessarily want them to drive faster we want them to drive 10 to 15 miles an hour probably 10 miles an hour through here maybe even five um, but in any event, we don't want to encourage wider roads. We don't want to encourage oversized parking spaces. We don't want to encourage too many parking areas. Um, but if we don't have enough parking areas, that'll hurt us financially because we won't be able to rent them. So we don't want to do that either. So if you go look at, actually, if you go to Worcester, and I'm not suggesting this is Worcester at all, but they do a maximum parking. So they'll do, they'll do and, and I don't like that either. Um, they'll tell us we can only do um, 0.5 parking spaces because they, you know, and, and the future might bring that. We don't know. We, we, we may have all be using Ubers and all be calling up electric cars to come pick us up, and but probably not in my lifetime, but um, maybe in his lifetime. Um, so, again, this, these parking ratios work good for us now. This density, this plan worked good for us now. But if we're considering, you know, buffering areas off the abutters and, and you're considering the height to our buildings, these buildings here to the abutters, then we'd, we'd have to probably reduce density in order to address those concerns. So it's based on your feedback to us. And we look at it and say, um, and, and we'd hope that there's some give and take on both sides is what we're hoping. So yes, we have considered, we've talked about it, different things. We've we've already, these two buildings were originally four-story buildings. Uh, now they're three-story buildings. Um, so if I can continue your thought. Mm -hmm. Please. So I, I tend to not think of um, density, okay. units per acre or any of that. I'm more interested in, in practicalities, right? So. Um, I want a excellent buffer along Suzanne Terrace, okay? I want to make sure that there's parking for those townhomes um, overflow, right? And I, I want to be honest with ourselves about the fact that certainly the, the architectural design I saw with no storage is going to result in people not parking in their garages, right? So I, I, so I want to make sure that there's places for those people to park. Um, moving out onto the street, if I remember correctly, right now, that intersection is a service level E. Uh, it'll become a service level F without your enhancements. Um, I would rather see the trip generation low enough that it doesn't go from E to F. So I don't know how many trips that is, but, you know, I don't want the trips trip generation to go higher than pushing it to F. Um, I don't want it to push it to half. Um, 
So it's things like that that I really look at. Um, and then, and then height. I, I, I think I have an issue with a four-story building. Um, it may be something that requires balloon testing, uh, or maybe some 3D. Um, I, I really love what the developer up at the uh, Highway Barn uh, in, in town did with essentially the drive-through video to help you visualize exactly what this is going to look like. I, I'm, I'm struggling to know, to know what this is going to look like from from 140, you know, where these buildings will be towering over stop and shop. Uh, I'd like to see that. So, so, in, in a, so I may really have an issue with the height of a four-story building. It's things like that. You know, if, if you can address all those things and maintain the, the, the unit count, have at it, right? Mm. Um, Fair enough. But, you know, those things need to get addressed. And I think the reality is we're probably talking about a project that's a half the size or less. And I think we need to have an honest conversation. Is are you are you prepared to do that? Because if you're not, we should just stop this now. There's no reason to go forward if you're not in a position to cut this thing. I'm sure it's going to end up getting cut in half. No point in spending any more of your money, wasting any more of our time. You you you've given us you've given us your feedback, and we'd like to address this plan with your feedback, not just arbitrary. Cut it in half, cut it in third. I, 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 you know, I respect that. I absolutely a, respect that. Picking yep. numbers. Okay. So, you know, and I and I respect that too because a lot of times, I, I've done a lot of permitting and a lot of times people just so arbitrary about the numbers right. and has no relationship to density and how it works with the neighbors and how it works with the development itself too. So I would appreciate that approach. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's fine. And, and by the way, I've done a lot of 40Bs. And, and just to clarify, my my mentioning density i think really speaks to the more granular things that I, I think it's generalizing but there's just too much here i guess in general would you consider houses instead of apartments <clears throat> i mean one of my concerns for grafton right now and i've lived here quite a while um we probably have over a thousand on the books right now what apartments it's it's up there. It's, yeah, it's, probably or close, close to, to it. Because if you add in J stuff, yeah, well, yeah, probably close to it. So I don't want to see us get to the point where maybe either they don't get built, or they get built and they're not occupied, or we're hiring people to come into town to rent them from you, which that's a joke. But um, <laughs> I'm a house person. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I lived in an apartment once. Uh, I don't. It's and you may, fine. It, a lot of people love them, so. And you may go back to it because what because what we find is that most of our tenants are either um, young kids starting out, sure, or people our age, right, downsizing, and maybe going to Florida or something for the winter too. So we're getting that's our that's a lot of our mix of our people. Um, as far as empty apartment buildings, I, I hope not because I can't afford to uh, pay them <laughs> well, much if they're empty. I mean, I don't, I don't know what this town's going to turn into, and that's kind of my fear. Uh, apartment people are different than house people, or house people are different than apartment people. These, these, these are going to be very attractive. I'm not. No, I'm not saying they're not. No, and, no, and I know they'd be nice. I, I, I know that. I'm but. telling you, if, if you, if you stood outside one, one of the these buildings built and you just kind of profiled the people going in and out I, you'd be they're pretty they're like they're you and i it's you and i to, to be honest with you the density is probably what's bothering a lot of us the traffic it's going to cause it's different uh, and i know the traffic engineers will say it's no big deal but uh well no actually they if you read it they, it is a big deal no okay so they have said because it, cause it's dropping a service level. I mean, myself, I'd like to see 30 houses in there. We're building houses at the other end of the town, and they're, and they're a million dollars a piece. Right. They're not affordable. No, these would, well, one fourth of these would be, but they probably wouldn't be in that range if you put 30 in there. The cost of housing is so you'd, high. You'd these probably days. put six or 700,000 in there for today's market. People don't build new houses for six and seven hundred thousand today. I, I, it's a shame to say. 
All right. Anything else? Um, we'll get we'll get the public comment. I just want to echo Bill what you're saying about <clears throat> just the the overcrowdedness, and I think you know just to be clear, I think we've only scratched the surface in terms of the problems with this site. Uh, you've heard, we, we've heard from Jeff tonight. We've heard some other comments, but <clears throat> you know it, th there's a lot of issues with respect to access. There's a lot of issues with, with respect to site design. Um, you know, this is a project that I would recommend that we have Cliff Bomer come back in. Cliff helped us with the Prentice Place project. You know, you're, you're driving into the site to access four apartment buildings, you know, with you know, over 200 units, and you're accessing it through this narrow driveway that basically weaves through a townhouse development. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, you, you typically would have an apartment development with a, with a, with a dedicated access off of the road. Because you're going to have a lot of traffic. You're going to have deliveries. You're going to have Ubers. You're going to have the people who live in apartments tend to use delivery services a lot more than people who live in houses. This, this is going to drive the townhouse people nuts to have constant stream of traffic going past our houses. So that, there's a lot of design issues with the site. We haven't even talked about trash management. How's trash going to be picked up? You've got, what, five dumpsters serving 474 bedrooms? Where's the recycling? Actually, we're probably going to go to one one location. Uh, we're going to probably reduce those down to one. Do the build Do the apartment buildings have trash rooms? No, we're probably going to reduce to one. You know, mechanical trash compactor. That's in each, what, in that's each what building. Just, I'm sorry. In each building, or no, just one on site. So, so everybody in an apartment building has to take their trash out of their building and go to some. They have to walk down the edge of the roadway. Right. I, there's just a lot of practical. Yep. Things that don't make sense, <coughs> and I agree. we haven't looked at the the auto turn yet. We haven't even talked about the water quality impacts of this project on the zone one. This is a municipal well, and we heard some comments at the last meeting about uh, this being a fragile environment. Um, there's an, the, the primary infiltration system for all the roadway runoff is dumping uh, the stormwater into a into a wetland that's probably a vernal pool. Um, and this wetland is most likely hydraulically connected to the well field. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I did say my expectation is that they, they go above and beyond and they address the fact that, you know, we're in that wellhead protection area. So if we're going to go forward on this design, I think we're looking at cliff. We're looking at a hydrologist to, to model the water quality impacts. We need traffic peer review who's going to have, I think, real problems with the internal access as well as we even talked about the intersection of Snow Road and 122. I mean, that, that's immediately a problem. Yep. Um, I don't know how you fix that. No, I, I, I agree. So if you had fewer units, that's not a big a deal, as big a yep. deal. Um, so I, it seems like we're at a crossroads, and it seems like the applicant can come to us and say, look, I'll work with you guys to redesign this site to make it more. Um, well, that's what I basically heard him say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was going to, a little bit later, I was going to get to the, to the, I, I didn't remember his name, but you know, you know, w would there be interest in, in something like that? But um, you know, l l let's come back to that, because because I'm gonna I'm gonna add something else that's gonna make that's gonna hit your pocket even more. Um, so uh, we have a letter from the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, you have probably haven't even seen it because it just came in today, um, but it talks to something that has been mentioned before, and that's the idea that you know we want. Uh, some of the units to be uh, made available to people who make 60% AMI and some available to 50% AMI. Um, we have a couple of the projects in town that have done this. Um, the Board of Selectmen was supposed to have asked for this. I suspect it wasn't really asked very strongly, but I'm quite confident the Affordable Housing Trust asked for it. Um, I'd, I'd like to know why that wasn't done. Why didn't you, when, when, when the Board of Selectmen asked for 50% AMI and 60% AMI, some number of units made available at that level of income, why wasn't that included? So, uh, <clears throat> James Venacasa, that was requested. Uh, we worked with Ray Mead on that. He did request that. We actually did a whole performer to show, you know, at that level, at those, at those rates, the cost that it would, that it would do to the project. Um, it is a higher end project where, you know, it's beautiful. It's... Do you but remember roughly what those costs were? Off the top of my head, no, but Ballpark. I do I do have that. It was millions. 
it was millions to get those to get those rents down. Nonsense. Absolutely, because when you look at it, if if you're not going to rent down, I got it. Right, I'm, I'm going to cut you off right there. Okay. Nonsense. Okay, using your own numbers. Right, your own numbers that are in here. Mm -hmm. Your annual rent is eight point two million dollars. Mm -hmm. That's what you'll collect annually. Mm -hmm. Of that. It's only three numbers we need to follow along here, folks. And I've got the spreadsheet to back it up. And again, these are your numbers. Mm -hmm. Of the 8.2, it's actually 8.293. <laughs> the affordable units at 80% AMI will pay you 1.421 annually. Okay? If we change it to a mix, that's roughly what Eastland did with Pleasant Street and Upton, which is essentially 15% at 80%. 5% at 65% at 50. So these numbers, I had to use Eastland's numbers, which are at this point are a couple years old. So, so these numbers are actually low. <clears throat> okay. The 1.4 million that you would get for the, for the affordable units drops to 1.18. In other words, it drops $240,000. It'll only cost you $240,000 per year. Could you say that number one more time? Sorry, I, I might have missed it. It'll that. drop to $1.181. 1, 1, 1, from 1. 1.4 to 1.8. 1. No, 1.18. 1. 1.4 1. 1. to 1.18. 1. Okay. It's essentially $240,000. Okay. That's what it'll cost you. Eight. Not millions. But the whole project is only $8 million. But if you amortize that over a 30-year... It comes up with the millions. That's what I'm saying. Why, so you're saying. Why are you, you amortizing? This is these are rental units. This is annual rents. So to the so value your operating budget will drop from because it's a from eight point two nine three million to eight point oh five three million. Your annual right. operating budget for the first year it'll, right. and it will change quickly. Yep. Will drop by two hundred forty point. Correct. Three three points. It, yeah, but when you when you run the numbers to, on the value of these and what the costs are these, you, you run these at a thirty year amortization. Okay. So if you if you run a two hundred thousand dollars, and you you know if, if it's a negative two hundred thousand dollars, that does cost. It's the value of that is you know millions, and that's why a lot of it's these three really points. aren't getting. It's three points. It, it's I, I can run it's it. It's two hundred. It, it's two hundred forty thousand dollars per year. Per year, right. right? Over thirty years. So what you're telling us is that the project works for you if you collect eight point two nine three million mm -hmm. annually, but it doesn't work for you if you only collect eight point oh five three million the, annually. The, so a lot of these projects are not getting built right now, right? So a lot of them are having issues. They're really tight. When you run the performers on these, they're extremely tight, even just at the 80%. So when you start reducing okay. down, so down. So you're, you're telling me that 8. 8.2 whatever works, but 8.053 doesn't. We're trying, what, we're trying not to build a project that fails. We're trying not to build correct. a project that doesn't pro form out. Correct. That's what we're trying right, to but do. But you're telling they, they me that, that $240,000 on an eight point something million annual budget doesn't work. So you're oversimplifying it. it, it no, I'm not. No, I'm not. It, it, that, it, that's it, it, that's it, the reality. Okay. You get $8.3 million if you do all at 80%, or you get $8.02 million if you do some of them at 50 and 60. Right. I, I that's, understand, that's obviously, the numbers, the numbers sound very big, but obviously there's a you know big expense to this, too, clearly, right? Like, there's big mortgages, there's big expense to these two, so I understand that we're collecting $8 million, but, you know, that's not a fair to say that, you know, that the mortgage, everything else is going to stay the same, but obviously the income's going to reduce down. So if you tell me your costs are going to stay at X and your they income's just going to reduce down, obviously that, that does Cost hurt two hundred forty a year. That's what it's going to cost you, it's two forty a year. Two hundred forty thousand is what the, it will cost the, you. The project will cost two hundred forty. No, that's what by providing sixty percent and fifty percent oh. units at right will cost you two hundred forty thousand a year. Correct. On an eight point three million dollars. I just project. want to get back to obviously when when we stated that the cut does cost millions. That's that is what that is. Is that really is you know millions if you amortize that over thirty years is how you do these projects in order to get banks and anybody to okay to, so to, divide, to finance this project. The affordable housing trust has asked for it. Yep. The selectmen have asked for it. The town has asked for it. This member is asking for it. Yep. I think that's got to become part of what you're doing. If we're gonna, if we're gonna move forward with this, we can. Yeah, to, and, and I guess to get back to your first point of, you know, we could run it and show you and to be, you know, to show what's fair and what's what's actually reasonable. What we what can be built. You know, yep. I could definitely run all these numbers and, yep. and get these for you. Absolutely. We tend to build a little nicer project, um, and I'd hope that 
you would have the same aspiration for us to do that. And as you keep hammering our numbers down and make them more affordable, we're not going to have the money to do that. We don't want to do that. No. So, you know, we've, we've got another developer in town who's doing two of them like that. So it's kind of hard to see it. Well, if you looked at one of our developments and you looked at theirs, you might, you'd see the difference and you'd see why, you know, we have to do what we have to do. We've actually done that. Have you? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You both build nice developments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you both build nice developments. Thank you. But, you know, the bottom line is 80% AMI is nice, but there's a lot of people, working class people, mm -hmm. who don't even make 80% AMI. Mm -hmm. And those people need places to live as well. And at this point, this town has worked very hard to get into Safe Harbor. Mm -hmm. we've, we've approved and built a lot of affordable housing. I think this board owes it to the town of Grafton to do the right thing for the town. That's why when I mentioned the, the, the playground, yeah. we need to make sure if we're going to get, if we're going to go ahead and waive various zoning bylaws so you can build this project, yes. we need to get something in return. Mm -hmm. And with all due respect to the select board, I think they really dropped the ball on this one. Because really, all they're getting from you is $300,000, right? We need to get more. And, and that, so, you know, I think we need more affordability. Um, they mentioned the playground, so let's get the playground. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we need to so, get in. And then to, you know, to speak to this, too, as well, is obviously, you know, if you're asking us to reduce everything down and then reduce yep. down the unit counts as well, right? So it's, I mean, something I really, we got to give somewhere, right? Where yep. we can't, we can't keep reducing down obviously the profit because when you're doing the affordable I units right, the I, reason we have the density I, is to pay for the affordable units you know through it so i can't reduce down unit count reduce down you know the affordables I reduce down the rents reduce 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 right i mean at so, some point so, so, maybe, it's so maybe the project doesn't make sense i think oh. it's a great location for this and you know it's so, but, but all, all, access, all i'm know, saying affordable is, housing is all i'm right. saying is, is as you try to meet the requirements of the town yeah Maybe it just doesn't make sense. But you guys are going to go off and you're going to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And come back to us and we'll see. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments from the board? So I know, I, I suspect somebody wants to speak. And I have to be <laughs> 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 I was going to let Mr. Whitney go, but okay. Well, he'll probably follow me. Um, just first before, oh, yeah. I need you to clearly yes. state your name and address and give me at least a minute to write it all down correctly. Thank you. <laughs> Name is Tony Sikora, 3 Greeny Drive. Thank you. Spoke at the last meeting. And then I'm just, if you haven't signed in, also make sure you sign in, especially if you're getting up to speak. First, I want to thank Bill. You're hitting a lot of points. Density is a concern to almost everybody there. I took our little map that's on the website, was used last time to show this lot that we're talking about plus the surrounding area made duplicates of it cut it out and overlaid it to the property in the whole general area even going over to the side of two of 90 where i live 26 homes in the same amount of property 26 residences you're talking 268 residencies whether they be apartments or whatever two three bedrooms same as most of these houses are density which you keep bringing up spot on thank you very much and i'm sure a lot of people here agree with that 22 feet i know everybody was trying to visualize 22 feet your builder i think i take it or been in building two feet tiles 22 feet is from here here to that wall that's all you got each one of those tiles is two feet you can count them out shows you how close that is there's no way a fire truck is going to make that turn i'm a limo driver part-time retired right now i go into a lot of these places there's a lot of nice ones when i pull into these trying to get around with just a normal limo forget it <laughs> it's a mess Parking is ridiculous. You mentioned LIP. That tells me this town has already approved this. I'm glad to see a lot of conversation coming up here. 
My last is I don't know how many in the town have received this letter. I know Chris, uh, Chris uh, Katrina. Katrina. <laughs> you mentioned you did. This nice little infamous hard card about our water in this town. <clears throat> 264 more residents or 68 more residents that this town is going to be paying back to them because of our water problems because of what this project plans on doing little visual aid let's say this is is it 17 acres 14 14 14 acres Cut that in half, seven acres, take that much. You're going to take all the water that was being dispersed in that area, and now you're basically going to drive it into these, well, we don't have the map up now, but drive it into them well areas. I worked for 15 years doing a lot of civil work, a lot of energy management work, a lot of water and hydrology work doesn't work doesn't work this is going to be even intensified because if anybody ever if you read this far and deep enough it's all caught the majority of the pollution that they're trying to take care of in our water is runoff from house paints roof sidings roofing and everything else and asphalts that's winding up in our water system brown and now you got the brown water system that you're going to take and put a 20 excuse me a 10 to 1 density compared to the rest of the town and you're putting it right by the wellhead I think this you you made it right and set it right this project has to get slashed big time down to 20 maybe 30 homes in that area saving the wetlands and the rest of the stuff in the area thank you Thank you. Um, yeah, Mr. Whitney, you can make your way up. Um, but I'll, let me just say something that I normally say during the first meeting, but I wasn't here to say it. So, um, you know, I appreciate uh, everyone respecting everyone's time. Um, you know, try not to get into too much detail repeating what has already been said. Um, that's not to say if you agree with what somebody said, then, you know, acknowledge the fact that you agree, that, you know, you think that this problem is, is legit. But let's just try not to go into too much detail repeating things. Um, <coughs> As far as the water quality in town, that's really not an issue for this board to be dealing with. The, the, the water department has said that there is sufficient capacity to supply this. They say it's not a problem. Um, you know, there's really, the, the, the water quality is really a separate issue. I, I, I've got the same thing. You don't need to wave in my face. Um, so, you know, that, I, I, I get it. I mean, it's, it's a problem. We have a problem in this town with water, but unfortunately, the water department, at least with respect to this project, doesn't seem to think there's a problem. Um, and, if, and if you have a problem with that, talk to them, please. Um, and then the last thing, as far as the lip goes, you know, the lip is, you know, I'm sure Dan could go on as far as what it, what it really technically is, but it really doesn't mean a whole lot to this process, whether we're in Safe Harbor or not. I mean, this is still a Chapter 40B development that's come to us. The fact that the selectmen have said they like it is almost irrelevant to what this board is doing. So the idea that it's already been approved, not true at all. Not true at all. The selectmen, the select board have said they approve of it. That's nice. Doesn't mean anything to this board and what we're doing. Mr. Whitney. Richard Whitney, 13 Greeny Drive. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask uh, our attorney if there's been a mistake on the application, what is the procedure? It depends what the mistake is. Well, stating that it's open land and there's no other dwellings or buildings on it, does that classify of falsifying a application? I, I don't know what you're referring to that there is a house there. number five on the application okay states by Stephen Benacosta states that it's nothing is on this property but there is a house mrs. snows he signed it it's in the documents what do we do 
he's stating that there's nothing there. So this is a statement from him. I, this is uh, at least the 12th 40B that I've been involved with, maybe more okay. over the course of the last 20 years. I've never had an application come in that doesn't have mistakes. Okay, that's right? what I'm asking. I, yeah, no, no, I mean, I pointed out, you know, there's clearly a, something wrong with the unit mix and, and the yeah. drawings, are right? You know, they need to make it right. Okay. Okay, so, you know. That's if, what I'm trying to. Yeah, they, they just, they, right. they need to make it right. Nobody's okay. not like we throw the whole thing out and they. All right, last them. meeting, last meeting, um, they said this was your first 40B. I don't think they said that. Yeah, they did in the beginning. Or the first 40B lip. No? Okay, then I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, let's just move. I got two other things. For now, this is going to be... First 40B in, in Grafton, maybe? In Graft, maybe. Okay. That's a, I mis, mistook it. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, this is going to be a two-year build-out, basically, because they can't do nothing because we're in Safe Harbor for two years, right? No. They could start tomorrow if we gave them permission. Yeah, that's correct. Even though we're in safe harbor. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go on to um, the waiver, the waiver for the building um, of the four-story building. Mr. Vanacosta says, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Vanacosta. Vanacosta. Thank you. Okay. You stated uh, at the end of the meeting last time that you want the waiver for the four-story buildings because the elevators were a lot of money. Well, isn't the elevators part of doing business? We have uh, properties, uh, apartment buildings here in town that are three-story that have elevators, and you're not getting the money back because of the elevators, you know, the four stories making the money off the apartments. Because I did look at, today, I did look at your apartment um, prices from what was it, $1,900 all the way up to $3,400, $3,500, and they're all electric heat and stuff. So that average person, that a kid coming out of college and that, is not going to be able to afford these, uh, number one. Number two, the density really, uh, and I've lived in this town all my life, almost 70 years, okay, and my family's been here over 100 so this property in Mrs. Snow's that we used to play on, baseball and everything else, um, it's a wonderful piece of property. I've seen your buildings. I've seen their buildings, the one in Millbury. Um, it's very nice, a little tight getting in and out of it because I did it with my trailer the other day, getting something for somebody. Um, but it looks nice. But this project, it really, all honestly, um, needs to be cut down. And the last thing... I want to say is I was at the water district's open house and there was a gentleman there and I forget forgot his name in the company but he's working for the water district he said to me because we got on the conversation about this he said this might be in a zone four which means you can't build at all near it depends on how the water is running and he is one of the ones that are doing the filter system for the town okay um, and he says unless they want to put in a collective water system to collect all the runoff and filter it themselves before they drain it out he says that would cost them a couple million dollars to do um, he know he said he knew the property very well and uh, it wasn't suitable and he, then he said to me that it's not a 400 foot from the wellhead. It's a 600 foot. That's what he said. And um, so again, what I heard from Dan earlier saying about the well and you, Bill, um, that's, and I live right up the street from this property and I'm just worried because I got both wells, East Street and I got Worcester Street well. You know, and uh, granted, by the time we get through all this and everything else, who knows? I might not be here. So, but um, at least I'm getting my thoughts out there to you guys to make your decisions um, and to, you know, do a good decision, which I know you're going to do. 
Um, but again, I really got to get back to it. I like the way they build. Don't get me wrong. I want something that will work for the town. It's not so much money driven or putting money in your pocket. It's making a good product that you can stand back and sit back and say, you know what? I did a heck of a project and my grandkids, my son's grandkids can say, you know what? Your grandfather did this 60 years ago. And you know what? And look at all the nice people that he's got looking, working there and, and living there. And that's what you got to think about is the people, not the dollars. Because you know what? I found out a few days ago, you can't take it with you. And I'm serious. You've got eight million, $800 million in projects you've done. And where is that getting you today, all honestly? We can say focused on this. I'm sorry. Where is it getting them today? You know, Bill, it's, you, you can't put it in a coffin with you. You can't take it with you. We have our hands full with this project. I can't get into all of his other I'm projects. sorry. <laughs> I get carried away, and you know that. But uh, that's what I'm saying. Let's build something. That's, that's what we're all trying to do. Right. And I wish, and I'm asking you nicely, if you could do it. That's all. Okay? All right. So um, because it came up again, I just want to read to the out loud here what we received from the Grafton Water District. All right. So this came on Wednesday, October 30th was the date. Katrina, there are no concerns from the Grafton Water District, period. 400 foot is the required protection zone around the well, period. All right? That's what your water district has said to this board. Now, everyone in town can parade up here and tell us how bad the water is, and we need to do all sorts of things to protect the water. The bottom line is we need to kind of go by what the Deck Grafton Water District says. That's what we're kind of stuck. So if... if, if if you want something more out of the water district, I think somebody needs to talk to the water district. I will tomorrow. Thank you. Somebody else. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. I'm, thank you again. I'm Lucy Beauregard. I live on 31 Snow Road. Uh, what I haven't heard anything about is snow removal and the effects, what we're going to do with it. I mean, if it's a big a development, it's going to have to be removed. Who's going to be removing it? And where are they going to place it? If they're going to place it behind the garages that abut the water situation, the wells, I mean, um, isn't that going to pollute it somehow? To Mr. Walsh, I, I assume they address snow storage uh, on the... Snow removal, snow Honestly, storage. I don't remember if they did or they didn't. We would get the standard answer that we will push it aside, and when we don't have enough room anymore, we're going to haul it away. And I can say that I think the they, ring of buildings and so forth... I think they showed a couple little areas, but they're going to... They, if they get a two-foot stone, they're going to truck it all. Yeah. So uh, what, generally what happens is there should be some areas that they can push it to, right? They, there yeah. has to be. Otherwise, there has to be, yeah. Otherwise, they're going to push it into parking spots, and now we get back into the parking discussion. So there needs to be a place they can push it to, but then, as, as Mr. Adams said, and he's done this uh, professionally, they'll end up coming in and hauling it out. You know, mm -hmm. No, they're not going to be able to just take it and dump it off of their land down onto the water district land or anything like that. that, that or not processed. Huh? Somehow it would need to be processed. Well, filtered or whatever well they, they can't do it right they, they can't dump it off the land and then what we've already talked about tonight is on their land any storm water runoff and that would include snow melt we we really want them to do more than the state minimum to capture any pollutants or solids suspended solids anything like that to try and clean that water as much as possible before it gets into the ground okay that's what we've asked for okay all right thank you Roger Boragad, 31 Snow Road, along with the snow uh, theme. If the sidewalks are extended, what's the town's policy on clearing the sidewalks? Is it responsibility of the residents that the sidewalk goes by, or does the town clear the sidewalks? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know what Grafton's policy is. But... I mean, if we go all the way out to Suzanne Terrace, there's a lot of homeowners that are going to be impacted, yeah. some with a couple hundred feet of frontage, right? So you're saying you don't want sidewalks <laughs> on your house? I'm not saying I don't want sidewalks. I'm saying when there's 
two feet of snow on them, yeah, I, who's going to clear them? Does anybody know what? I, I don't. Know, I've never heard of a policy in town. I know. The, I know the highway department does some. Yeah. But they don't I mean, I know there's policy. some towns that, you know, if it's in front of your house, you need to clear it. Yeah, I know. Well, that's what's I, up. I, I, I don't know. We. I can. I can try to inquire and, right. and, and find out for you. Okay. Great. Thanks. Somebody have their hand up, sir. I'm Robert Brian Bonner, B-O-N-N-E-R, at uh, 21 Snow Road. I agree with the water concerns. Um, I heard today something about the board is going to decide whether there are two-bedroom units or three-bedroom units. That sounds a little weird to me, but I encourage you to say two. Um, uh, I would also... Uh, suggests that I would be very comfortable with 30 houses at $2 million a piece in that property. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, um, there was a, um, a mention last meeting about moving the entrance to be directly across from the Maxwell Drive entrances. I don't know if that's something that the board would entertain asking the applicant to do since you've already asked them to make some modifications to some plans. Um, that was, uh, I walked that road quite a bit, so um, that might be a, an impact to the uh, people coming and going from, from, from the property. Um, the other thing that, did, that uh, concerned me was that I didn't, I thought with the uh, safe harbor, that they would not have approval to proceed with any construction. And it sounded like tonight that they can go through with waivers from this board. And I would encourage this board not to issue any waivers for the height and uh, the setbacks. I think the setbacks were already addressed, so I won't get into that. But um, I don't think it's a a... I don't think this project with the uh, the number of units that are being planned is uh, appropriate for that for our neighborhood there. Um, I understand it; uh, it's fairly close to the shopping center, but there are two other houses on the um, south side of this development between Stop and Shop and this development. Um, anything that is in the line of the Maxwell Drive Apartments, which is the Grafton Housing Authority, is is probably appropriate. But anything larger than that, I don't think it is for the, the neighborhood. Thank you. So uh, because it's gone up now a couple of times, the, the safe harbor, to understand what safe harbor means, let's take a step backwards and understand that with a normal Chapter 40B application, um, the, the town's hands are very tied as far as what we can and cannot uh, ask of the developer. Essentially, the state is essentially going to say you don't have enough affordable housing, or you're not, you know, making enough progress to meet your your goals. So you know the developer can get pretty much what he wants, and um, you know it's a little bit more complicated than that. But we'll just leave it at that. Now that we're in safe harbor it kind of turns the tables because, well, we do have enough affordable housing or we are making sufficient progress towards our goals, so the state can't say that anymore to us. So it kind of puts the town in the driver's seat. Um, so we can, uh, we, you know, we, we, can, we can insist that they, you know, increase the buffer space, that they, you know, do various things if they, if they want to build this project. Um, that's really the difference. It doesn't necessarily mean the project can't happen at all or no project can happen. The project can still happen. And the idea is once you're in safe harbor is that you really should be working. And that's what this board has a responsibility to the town to really work with the developers to make projects that are uh, uh, of maximum benefit to the town, not just maximum benefit to the developer, which is typically how developments happen. So that's really the difference. But the developments absolutely can happen. So I see someone else, ma'am. Colleen Roy, 
53 Elmwood Street. I have a question, a technical question about the parking. Um, when you're doing the parking calculation, how do you include parking spots that have to be paid for? And can you include parking spots that have to be paid I know you did, but... but That's a really good question. I mean, I'm not sure. I, I look at the physical availability of the parking spaces and... Um, because in, in theory, those all those garages could be empty, right? They no nobody wants to pay the extra to, to rent them, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And that does happen. There's a project in Wayland uh, that was built with a ton of garage spaces, but they were charging an arm and a leg for them. No one was renting them, and then so all the surface spaces were full. So that that is an issue. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly an issue, and I'm not trying to you know look at the developer side but on the other hand if he's got an investment in a building even if it's at a building with a few light switches in it and a few light bulbs in it he's going to adjust his price to I, generate revenue i i would think so yeah i think so find the man. Price and yep. i think it really depends on the owner if it's a multinational <laughs> apartment owner that rhymes with babylon <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Is that legal? <laughs> they may not. They may not adjust the prices. Sure. But a mom and pop okay. type. Could that be? Right. Might, yeah. Yeah. Our, our current communities was a waiting list for the for the garages. They they fill up immediately. I, I would think so. I mean, they, you know, they do. If they're no. sitting empty, you're going to lower the price. A hundred percent. No, we have a waiting list on them that we've never had an issue. Do they fill up with toys or do they fill up with... <laughs> I was just going to ask the same question. <laughs> well, I mean, somebody vet, my no, age, I'm going to buy a 68 vet and put in there and never and drive it four times a year. But you will have a parking space for it. <laughs> no, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't count them. To me, we shouldn't count them. I, I don't disagree with you. And, I, and, and that's, I, I mean, so... Or maybe count half or something, but... Which I think that's part of the reason why we like this board likes a bigger number, right? I mean, I, I understand that 1.66 is often used, but we've always yep. strived for more because we understand the reality is, you know, that they're, they're not all going to be parking spots. Well, I've got a two-car garage. I fill it with junk, and I have to park outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I think we're all in that. You know, all you need to do is, is go over to Prentice Place on, like, a Friday night or a Saturday night, and, and, and the, the parking lot is full. You know, so, um, you know, we, we didn't over provision parking at Prentice Place, right? And Prentice Place is three buildings, it's 40, 40 or 50 units. It's 40 units. For, 40 units? 40 units. I mean, you know, so it's, I think it's a decent representation. What was the ratio on that? Just I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay. It, we, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was more than 1.66. Okay. I think it was the just doubles. under two. I think it was just under I think two. It was like, yeah, yeah, it was, I can look it up, but I think it was. Yeah. I think the counter argument, though, would be that. If, if you if you don't build it, they won't come, right? So it's yeah. kind of self-selecting. If you only provide one space per unit, if you're a tenant, you can't bring a second car. Um, it becomes a problem if they end up illegally parking in the driveway, in the, yeah. in the yards, and that's an enforcement issue. So then suddenly, then the town has to be more about to have a police officer go down there every day checking to see if the, the driveways are blocked. And I don't want to sign a town up for that. No way. Uh, we're going to get to people on the phone first. Uh, so you've got people online that yeah. have hands up? Ed, you can talk. Hold on. Go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. Ed Prisby, 25 Daniel Drive. Um, yeah, I happen to be chair of the Affordable Housing Trust. I'm speaking, obviously, in my own capacity here. Um, and, I, you know, I don't usually do this. I'm not easily offended, but I think... Um, whether you guys know it or not, you owe an apology to a lot of people uh, right now. I heard tonight that apartment people are different <laughs> than house people. Peter, it's not funny. Um, you know, I was born in the 70s. I lived in an apartment for the first 10 years of my life. Um, you know, I lived in an apartment from 1995 to 2011. And I was lucky enough to afford my first home that I've been living in for 14 years here. Um, I, I am not less than you for having lived in an apartment. I'm not different than you for having lived in an apartment. My grandfather fought in World War II, lived in an apartment, raised a family there his entire life. Um, there are a lot of people in this community who live in apartments because they can't afford homes and they can't afford homes because we don't build enough of them. And we don't build enough of them because of meetings like this tonight. Okay. 
I put your quote up on All Things Graphic. It's been up there for 20 minutes. Another guy wrote in, said, well, a lot of us can't afford to buy a house, therefore we rent. In my case, I live on Maxwell Drive due to limited finances. I resent the notion that I'm less than anybody. So maybe build a bigger community for us than for us less thans. I grew up in this town. I've been here for 72 years. That guy needs an apartment. And much as I appreciate the conversations surrounding this particular development about density and about parking and about the feasibility of getting people on and off of Snow Road, those are all legitimate concerns. But the moment you start saying things like apartment people are different than house people, then number one, I'm going to get really pissed off. And number two, you've just handed somebody's lawyer all the reason in the world to say whatever decision that you make about this against this development is going to be arbitrary and capricious because you're discriminating against people who need the housing. Okay. That's my first thing. My second thing is what amazes me is that these conversations continue to be had as though you're not in a housing crisis in Worcester County. And I don't know if you guys know it. I know Bill does, but some of you are talking about this. Like you don't realize that Worcester County is the third most competitive rental housing market in the country. Not like locally, in the country. There are people out there who are suffering and need this desperately. And we continue to talk about this as though we quote unquote, have enough affordable housing in town. And whether or not you're in safe harbor, it's untrue. People in Grafton are still paying over 30% of their take home income to cover housing costs. And that's 30% of the residents. So 30% of your residents are housing insecure. And we're joking about, yeah, I'd rather have 30 homes at $2 million a piece. Ha ha ha. Funny to the people in the room, maybe, but not funny if you're like 28 years old and trying to start a family. Not funny if you're a single mom raising kids. Not funny if you're retired and living on a fixed income. And oh, by the way, there's an override coming. Okay, you guys need to change the attitude. What I heard here tonight was really unfortunate, and there needs to be an apology. Thank you. So I, I just want to um, address one thing. Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that I'm a real strong proponent of affordable housing. Um, I think I've gone to the mat in a few different areas with respect to affordable housing. But, you know, I understand that Mr. Prisby is also very much a proponent of affordable housing. He's a member of the Affordable Housing Trust, and, and the Affordable Housing Trust's job is to generate affordable housing. But the ZBA's role right now is not to generate affordable housing. The ZBA has been put in this position to represent all of the interests in town. Um, so, you know, yeah, affordable housing is a huge problem, and I don't disagree with that at all. It is. And I've got the 28-year-old daughter who can't afford to buy a house here in, in town. Um, but, you know, there's other interests in town. You know, there's conservation issues. There's planning issues. There's economic development issues. There's all kinds of other issues, and we need to really consider all of those. So, um, you know, as much as I would love to see a lot of affordable housing, and uh, you know, developed, you know, we can't just say yes. And likewise, I'll also point out that we could have said no on the first night, and we didn't, right? We could have said that, we didn't. So, you know, I think that, you know, it, it's unfortunate the process takes time. Uh, it's unfortunate that we need to have some conversations about density and try to do the right thing and make the best development. We're gonna do that. We're gonna continue to do that. Is there anyone else on the phone? Sean Fullwood, unmute, you can speak now. Sean? Hi, good evening, sorry about that. Um, so I've, I've heard a couple of things tonight uh, Sean, and I didn't I hear- your, uh, Sean, Sean, I oh. need your address, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm at uh, 22 Snow Road, North Grafton. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I, I heard it brought up last. Uh, last meeting was the traffic issue on snow road i had is that going to be addressed at a later time yes okay roger um with that i know the study was on snow road 
Um, coming out of there and uh, seeing traffic on 122 turning onto Snow Road, is there any proposal to address that traffic issue or study that? Um, so you get cars that back or turn onto Snow Road crossing over for, uh, left coming from uh, uh, Shrewsbury. Um, it backs up if you get like three or four cars in line. So is there any intention to study that traffic pattern? Yeah, so um, it, first of all, it already has the, the traffic study that the applicant uh, provided is already ad addresses that intersection, right? So it, it's it's all aspects of that of that intersection, and um, eventually the board will hire a peer review consultant to uh, look at that as well. So they'll review what the applicant has provided and uh, and do their own studying as well to, in in some respects. Um, but yeah, all all angles and flows of that intersection will be uh, will be addressed okay thank you okay tim Carigua, if you can hi uh tim, tim carriga 25 suzanne terrace okay go ahead um, the, the major issue I want to bring up, um, I'm one of the abutting properties and, um, I thought the points brought up by the board were excellent with the elevation and the density. And I agree with that. And, you know, hearing the buffer being only 15 feet, um, I think it was the first person who was there for public comment. You know, when you're talking 15 feet, you know, I'm not in the room with you guys, but it's, you know, from one wall to the other it's not that much and i just i really think there needs to be some consideration for the people along that suzanne terrace line um some sort of if this project goes through with the density that it is um it, it, i just think it's a it, it's a respect thing of you know i have kids i have a pool having a townhouse looking down on that i just don't feel comfortable with that um as a parent and i feel like that is just a something that can easily be changed if this project is scaled down. And I said this before at the first meeting, it's, it's your property, you bought it, you can, you can, you know, kind of quote unquote, do what you want with it. But I think there has to be some sort of respect to the people in the neighborhoods that are already established and working with them to create, um, you know, a buffer that is, you know, something that, that, that works for everybody. And I really appreciate um, everybody on the board speaking up about the density and the, the sheer size of the project. Um, and, uh, you know, look forward to hearing what, what changes will be made. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Whitney. Richard Whitney, 13 Greeny Drive again. The only question I have is, is the traffic study going to go from Snow Road to East Street? And what are we going to do about the people that come out of this project instead of going left down to Worcester Street, take a right to go over to the train station, and where we already have a problem at Route 30 with the train, what is this going to do in into that and that's what i forgot to ask yeah I, I assume the traffic study looked at east street as well to be honest i only looked uh right now at the um 140 um intersection i, I believe it i'm sure it, it must look at both ends, yeah. right yeah so yeah okay and the sidewalk up to suzanne terrace which we have about approximately 20 to 30 people with dogs in that walk and that has to be if you guys decide that it's gonna go forward we got to remember that every 200 feet has to be a turnaround for handicapped people. The yeah, they'll, it'll get built to okay. whatever ADA I'm requirements just, are necessary. It's why it's on my mind, Bill. Okay, okay that's it. Thanks. Bill, there's another guy. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if his Tim Kerwigus. Yeah, it's sitting next to me. No, there his is? hands down. Yeah. And then I Does I, anybody else want to speak? Yeah. Okay, there is something. And then it's Scott Novitsky. It has his hand up too. He just put it up, so there's no one behind. All right, we'll do we we'll to Scott next. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, Mark Potter, 14, Suzanne Terrace. Um, you know, I just want to thank everyone for their comments about, you know, working with the developer on making this good for the community. I think that's important. Um, some of the concerns that I have, I'll stick to stuff that maybe wasn't brought up. Uh, as far as any sort of security lighting or, or lighting on the property, 
what, what's the plan for that? So I, I, I think we'll, we're, we're a little we're bit ahead on yet. that one. Okay. We, that will, because <laughs> we just turned the whole thing upside down, right? So. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, they lit it up already. I mean, maybe yeah. a spinoff on, but, I, I know Tim, he's a neighbor. So uh, So let, let me just, let me finish that thought, right? So <laughs> lighting is, is critical when you've got neighbors like yourself right there. Close, yeah. And right. So, so that will get addressed, you know, and, and, you know, there will be like, you know, down lights and things like that that minimize um you know the effects off property mm -hmm. so you know because we absolutely got that will neighbor with a floodlight that goes right in their bedroom window you know that's <laughs> yeah, right, right. it happens no I, I understand so that it will be looked at at um, some point was there any ideas on maybe some fencing between the property as far as to give us that little bit of separation or some sort of privacy for those immediate abutters i think that's an excellent idea um and the last thing is um i've done snow removal for over 10 years and just looking at the the site plan i look at that and go i would never want to take that job because i there's nowhere for me to work realistically in there um and we would have to get it trucked out regularly which again i would think turn over to be an additional cost not just for you folks but that usually trickles up to the residents as well having done different condos and townhouses they always would fight us on the snow removal when the intersection gets unsafe and we're telling them like you can't see around if there's a kid or something over there while i'm trying to work and i'm not going to just show up and take one pile down i'm going to take all four piles down at a minimum of i don't know four hours per pile 150 dollars a guy plus the pieces of equipment that i'm going to bring over here and then i'm going to transport it out of here yep i think it all ties back to the density mm -hmm. exactly so i i can agree with that and like as someone else said you know it's your property you can develop it i fully expect it to get developed it's just maybe i'd like to see it scaled down a little bit thank you he may want your business card <laughs> <laughs> after he sees my prices <laughs> so mr novitsky okay scott you're up hi uh, scott novitsky uh 49 pleasant street um has there been any community outreach done as part of this project um coordinating with the butters i know it was done on pleasant street um maybe something it sounds like the abutters could really use that and have their voices heard around especially the fences or anything to protect the yards or just get their input directly to the um developer yeah um that's not right no no okay the answer yeah. to the question is no there is not <clears throat> we hear them loud and clear and we're, we're writing down all the comments yeah um I, I know that it sounds like there's we're you know i think there was a comment made that we this town does not necessarily embrace um affordable housing i think it's been over a thousand, almost a thousand apartments approved, all which had affordable components to it, or a lot of them had com affordable components in the past few years, which has put us in safe harbor. Um, so I, I think the town is doing a, a pretty good job in that. And yes, they didn't necessarily have themselves in a driver's seat, but I think now they do and they could do it the right way. Um, and I think with that, you know, given the comments tonight, um, it, you know, something this town maybe wants to consider around having a second option or some way for individuals to grow and continue to remain in town are maybe possibly some condos or um, some more of affordable way and progression into purchasing into town there's going to be a lot of apartments going up that have been approved there's some already built there's some not yet built um but i'd i'd love to see a plan that maybe does that and and gives individuals who are renting and enjoy the community to have some type of option or segue into it not these two million dollar homes that's not affordable but uh, you know i think about like pollard road has a couple of condos there that people could purchase potentially and you know given the um, the amount of affordable units that will be in town, um, this would be a good segue to keep these people here. Um, and I, I think that would be a, a nice option to see in this space. Um, and uh, I think those that, that was it. So. Thank you. Any, no one else on the line? 
No, nobody else is on. Anyone else in the room want to say anything? All right, so what do we see as next steps? I, 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 um, I mean, we could start you know, like going after traffic peer review, things like that, but I think you guys have some work to do. And, you know, do we want to? Well, I think it's really up to the applicant. Yeah. If he wants us to spend his money doing traffic peer review, I would recommend a design review and a hydrology review. Yep. Um, or do you really want to take a step back and think about all of these comments tonight in, in the overall design of the project? Well, we're certainly going to do that. We, we take the feedback and consider it. So, um, I, I think we can, uh, and you know, well, the point is, I, I think we can go down, we can be taking into account comments from the board, from the abutters, um, and look at things that we can do with the development to address those. And in parallel, look at traffic and then hypothetically if there's a traffic review um, and we do lose some density well then it's working at it's worse. still valid it, traffic. it's still valid because we're looking yeah. at a, an even more in conservative conservative uh, traffic review um, if, the, if the traffic works for 268 it works for any number less than that also I think there's a component to the traffic review that typically includes the on-site circulation, so that, that would change, but I agree with the off-site trip mm -hmm. generation, the intersection at 122, is that 122? Mm -hmm. um, the sidewalks, crosswalks, yeah, all that's probably going to be a constant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The interior is, is really easy for us to tweak. And, and typically, in when we get traffic reviews, it's for surrounding intersections off-site roadways the circulation throughout this within the site um, a lot of times that's driven by emergency vehicles and having turning radiuses and doing auto turns that um, with the emergency vehicles from the fire department so um, they're both traffic related but the off-site is usually an outside peer review the on-site is usually uh, uh, with the fire department or so actually question on on that is this do you have other developments with a similar design to this with the duplexes or um, townhomes you know as the main thoroughfare I guess into the property every, every piece of real estate is unique um, so I mean like, is there a, an example that you base this on or so it's like the one in Millbury that they could refer to 19 Canal Street that that's only two and a half acres and so there's there's no opportunity to put anything additional but one building and garage spaces the site here we've got 14 acres there's a lot of room to move things around so we well uh, but so my question is the a mix is that is another no the, of a mix of but those the traffic in and out of this, the concept is that it goes through these townhomes first, right? Before you get into the large apartment buildings. The, the, the thing is, when, when when you look at the numbers, it looks like there's a lot of traffic coming out of it. But if you stood at the... I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about numbers. I'm, I'm just talking about practicality of this traffic pattern. You know, and the impact of the uh, townhome. So the first answer is no. We don't have anything exactly like this. This the second thing is we viewed it, and we don't uh, we don't want to come in with a plan that doesn't work. So to us, this plan works. Although we hear the comments from the neighbors, we hear the comments from the board. We we may agree with all of them. We may agree with part of them, and then will be the give and take that we come back with you want so we don't we, well, see, I, we think the reason this I works asked was just to see if we can you know check out another property that kind of used this concept to see what because it, it is hard to, to picture it's it's not uncommon to, to be building projects like this today I've seen another other developers I have not built one myself like this but I've seen a number of other projects where you get the unit mix so that the townhomes would be a little bit higher priced. They would, and that, and uh, they could be 
more spacious. That's why we. Well, uh, but I'm not, I'm not talking about the. I'm talking about the. The layout. The routing and the, the layout. routing. The, the, it's the access the through traffic. the townhouses. It's not yes. about it's people right. pulling out of the parking areas. There's more of this. And and driving by the are townhouses. Talk, are you, right. Are you talking about the the townhouses at the entrance? coming through those well, townhouses. The, well, there's no way to get to those larger parking lots without driving through all of the townhomes. Well, we did that on purpose is putting the townhomes closer towards the street and the abutters because of the scale of them. So we, we specifically put the taller buildings in the back. But if, uh, if to your point, is is there a, a, a traffic or safety issue with cars driving by the townhomes? I, I, I'm, I don't know if there's a. I assume there's no safety issue. I'm. I'm just. Yeah, just throwing that out. I just generally, <laughs> practically speaking, does this really work, or is it a? You know, do I, the residents hate it. I think there's a real traffic safety issue and sort of alignment issue, and that's where the traffic engineer is going to weigh in. This intersection, you come in. There's only one entrance. You go, you know, 40 feet, 50 feet, and you hit T. So you're going to have people coming in and out on the left, in and out on the right. You're making an entity return to get to the back of the site. That this could, that's just going to be a very, very difficult, I think, intersection to navigate for anybody, much less emergency vehicles. So I, again, I think this is something that I'd want the traffic engineer mm -hmm. to weigh in on. I just, I've never seen anything like this, and I know that when I'm when I'm personally driving, you know, through tight areas to get to where I'm going, I, I can. The, the Spirit Court, <clears throat> the Spirit Courthouse in in Woburn has the weirdest access you have to drive through a shopping plaza to get to this to the courthouse and I, and every time i drive through there i'm like who thought of this design this makes absolutely no sense because you're driving through a, a supermarket aisle <laughs> a, a drive aisle to get to essentially a, a, a commercial area it just this isn't this is not typical I'm not criticizing it i'm just saying it's very very atypical from what i've seen in, in plans um so we we've got plenty of frontage to put multiple and exits or entrances out of here, but we think this design is far superior, far more desirable, far more attractive. I think what they're saying is, correct me if I'm wrong, having the townhouses up front looks more like not having apartment buildings sitting right on the road. Correct. So you're putting the taller buildings in the back, so that's right. why you have the townhouses because they're more aesthetically pleasing. And we specifically do that. And sometimes, if we don't have townhouses, sometimes we build garages. On, um, if you look at some other developments, we put garages, which brings the scale of things down. But the way the access is, I mean, it seems like that one exit, entrance and exit, seems really tight. So it's I be think, congested. yeah, right, right, right. So I think I understand why you would have the townhouses up front, but maybe just the access, the roads seem crowded, congested. So. I think maybe the plan might look a little deceiving because it looks like it's a little crowded, but it actually works really well. And and it's a typical driving aisle or, or a street to a subdivision is 24 feet, 22, 24 feet wide. Um, coming in and out of this on each of the in and out, it's 18 feet wide with a eight foot wide cobblestone apron in between, mm -hmm. which gives vehicles, larger vehicles, a little bit more room. Not that they need it, because 18 feet wide is, is fairly wide. Um, and aesthetically, it just well, kind it's of, like 18 and 18 is, 18 is, and 18 is, is a 36-foot wide pavement area. That's a lot of pavement. Right. Right. Who has the right of way at that intersection? So if you, when you're coming off of Snow Road, I don't see any stop bars anywhere here. So is, there, is that a three-way stop? Do, do the people coming down the cobblestone road, do they have the right of way? Do the other folks have to stop? Like how, does it, how does that work? Oh, when you're... <laughs> but, oh, when you're pulling in? Yeah. yeah. But Dan, are we kind of getting we're, into... Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, we can... Yeah, we, yeah. we can yeah. save this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But I just, it, it just illustrates my point. Is that right. I no, I understand. I understand. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have thought... I don't know if it's good or bad. <laughs> 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 I agree 100% with Kay's point about the lower buildings being out near Snow Road. Yeah. Um, and to swap them, it, it, it just doesn't play in right. But I don't have the answer to this, but I see a potential alternative. Concern has been raised about a single access point 
and concern has been raised about turning maneuvers at the T intersection within, and concern has been raised about two rows of townhouse dwellings that all the people going to the larger buildings in the back have to drive by. Rather than a single entrance and the traffic people could look at this in concept before, um, but the two entrances, like I think I might have been mentioned very briefly during tonight's discussions, one aligning with Maxwell Drive and one farther up to the north, but certainly not pointing to the dwelling of number 15 Snow Road. Now you have two access points that the people could come into either one and get to the larger apartment buildings without passing by those dozen or so dwellings that run north-south and um, a few dwelling units might be lost or relocated but what you're doing now is you're splitting half the large building traffic to the north half the large building traffic to the south and providing a quieter interconnection from the north drive to the south drive by that dozen or so dwelling units near snow road yeah i, I understand what you're saying it, it sounds good but I, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves i, I think you know, the applicant has asked for, you know, the, at this point, to, let's get the traffic peer review and let's get them in. They can look at this. Uh, hopefully the applicant understands that, you know, if, if things change, then, you know, the, the traffic review is going to have to look at whatever it changes to. Um, but let's, you know, let's see if, if the traffic folks come back and suggest something like you just said. I understand exactly what you're saying. And, um you know, I, I think it could be nice. Sure. I just wanted it to be food for yep. thought on the development mm -hmm. side yep. uh, I, as I, they go away from here. Let, 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 let's let the traffic folks look at it, sure. um, and then we can kind of dive in a little bit more in, in depth at that point. As far as hydrology and things like that, maybe we just kind of let that all sit for now. Let's see what they come back with, um, and, then, and then we can go from there. Yeah, okay. So I think at this point... Um, we're going to be looking at, to get the, the traffic peer review engaged. Now, you said um, Kevin DeAndre? Uh, yeah, I don't have any other names. Um, I, I, the, I, I thought I was fine with, with – am I misremembering something? Do we have a problem? we had a woman – we had that, the woman one time, didn't we? Up I up think there? maybe he there was sent a land. an associate. Oh, was. okay, okay. All right. Possibly. Yeah, all right. I don't know. I, I, thought, I thought we were okay with that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm I'm fine with with yeah, Kevin. Yeah. I'm fine with him. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, he did uh, Pleasant Street and Upton Street. I mean, yeah, I don't have any other okay. names. I, there's right. a, there's one other firm that that I actually really liked, uh, Environmental Partners. There's a, a woman traffic engineer there who is great, uh, but she's on maternity leave, so I really have no other recommendations. Yeah. Okay. I I, I think we're fine. I think we're fine. I did like um, Eastlands, whoever they had as their traffic person or their whoever prepared their report presented it's good i don't know if they do review or not do you know the name i can get it i can get it tomorrow or later tonight when we're done i can research it and find it but I, i'm fine with kevin as well uh, i don't think we need to okay i don't think we need to yeah, let, it up, you know. let's just go let's go with that um the company and you're and you're okay with us hiring what, a what was, what was the company again? TEC Tech. Do you have any conflicts with Tech? No, I don't think so. Oh, no. mm -mm. They do some developer side work. They do peer review work. Yeah. Where are they at? It, you know, I don't remember. I'm just curious. Okay, we're fine. We have no conflict. All right. Um, other than um, a vote to continue and determine when we're going to continue to, anything else we need to go over at this point? So, um, and ju just to confirm, you, you did not appeal the safe harbor, right? No. No. Okay. How much time do you want to review and make changes or address issues? <coughs> Yeah. Next month or thirty days. Yeah. So early in December. Yeah. So the fifth CPC is in here, and the twelfth Affordable Housing Trust is in here. But I'm sure I could get either of them to move. The nineteenth, I am not here.
Yeah, so um, the fifth would be four weeks. Mm -hmm. Everyone available on the fifth? Yep. <clears throat> All right. Is that going to be enough time for us to? I would think that's enough time for the traffic guy. Because you've got so. Thanksgiving in there. So. You want to bump it to that the 12th? matters, but. You want to bump it to the 12th just to be safe? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just because of the holiday. Yeah. All right. I entertain a motion to continue case number. What is this? 910. Case number 910 to December 12th at 7 p.m. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes. Mr. Adams? Yes. And I'm going to butcher your last name. Mejia. Mejia. Yes. <laughs> uh, Chairman or Vice Chairman, vote yes. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Waller. All right. Um, we do have minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. For Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Folks, if you didn't sign in on your way in, please sign in on your way out. We're doing it the 12th, correct? 12th, mm -hmm. yeah. 12th, 12th. minutes now that Jiffy entered the meeting at 716. I told him he's got to, oh, that's So right. he's out. He's out, yep. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. We really hadn't started anything, but you're right. All, all we were talking about was the safe harbor discussion. They hadn't started. I mean, because he wasn't here at 7? Yeah, I mean, well, it, can we wave that? No. But I'm not sure if you only miss a portion of the meeting. You, you think you're out for the whole meeting? Well, he can do a mullen. Yeah. But he's missing but tonight. But he's missing tonight. Tonight's right. whole meeting. So he can't do two mullens. But the first one was only 15 minutes. Uh, Not even. 11 minutes. And the opening portion was basically Brian um, reading the opening comments yeah, k read I, the le k read the legal notice and then we were talking about the safe harbor and he walked in in the midst of the safe harbor discussion yeah, so not, we hadn't I, even opened i'm not sure that disqualifies him I, i'm not aware of any rulings on that but it might be okay to to see. I, I suppose we can deal with it if we get to the point where right. we need Over here. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, Jeff. Thank Good you. Night. Thanks. Entertain a motion to accept the minutes. If no one has any other comments or changes, 
I move we accept the minutes of uh, October 3rd, 2024 as amended. So moved. No, you say second. Second, sorry. It's when you <laughs> say it, we say so. <laughs> Motion Maybe after seconded. 10 years, I'll get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Mr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Mejia? Yes. Chairman yes. votes yes. Right. This piece. Um, and that was my idea. We have a move we adjourn? <laughs> yes. Is that a second? Second. Uh, <laughs> yes, Mr. Mr. Reed? Yes. Mr. McCusker? Yes. Each. A little, Mr. Little Adams? Single family? Yes. Yep, that's fine. Yes. Yeah. We're adjourned. That's, uh,